Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next section of the day. Welcome back. Uh, I'm happy to present our next speaker, Professor uh, Jack Copeland from the University of Canterbury. Uh, he will be talking about, okay, so in the program it said slots in and oroning, but I'm no, that's, that's the, the title. Okay, okay, so slots in and oroning, what's the difference? And go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. So some of you would have heard a, a predecessor version of this talk, um, Orly and Nier and maybe a few others. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's this, this, this is kind of uh, version two, though you'll, uh, you probably won't remember the previous one anyway, but if you do, there are some um, definite changes in this one. Um, so uh, the size of slicing and rolling, I'll explain these mysterious terms as I go along. Um, basically, it's a talk about um, mechanization how to mechanize some interesting concepts, which um, kind of currently exist in... <laughs> <laughs> this is the first part of the mechanization. <laughs> so currently these concepts exist in the literature. Um, are sort of like mental constructs or something. Um, so, so my project is to um, try and implement these concepts so that, that um, machines can do them. You know, what mechanisms do we require? Um, but first I want to talk a bit about the history of the concept um, and explain my terminology, slicing and ironing, um, if I can work with technology. Um, so, uh, the history of indeterminacy of computation, it all begins with this guy, Ralph Slutz. I like to think of Slutz as um, the discoverer of the indeterminacy of computation. Um, I, I was doing some research a, a long time ago now, back in um, 1995, on the um, those first wonderful electronic stored program machines, you know, those room-sized computers, sort of the zero generation fascinating objects. Um, and Slutz designed and built one of those very early computers. And um, I was doing some work on Slutz. And I, was, I was very fortunate to find a tape recorded interview with Slutz in the archives of the, the Science Museum in London. And in this interview, Slutz described the concept that we now call the indeterminacy of computation. It's completely clear, there it is in this interview from long ago. Um, it was my first brush with the concept, and I was, I was fascinated as soon as I heard Slutz talking about it. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what he said. But here's the machine he built. They pronounced it the SEAC. Um, it, was, uh, it was built in uh, Washington, D.C. by Slutz and his, his buddy, Sam Alexander. Between the two of them, they designed and built it with the aid of a, a few kind of um, people to do the soldering and so on. Um, it's quite a famous machine. Um, the devices that you can see in the foreground, they're kind of peripheral devices there on the left, and then there's the control desk on the right-hand side. And then the actual circuits of the machine are behind that row of doors at the far end of the room. And as Slutz was designing those circuits, he realized that his machine was going to need far more AND gates than OR gates. And he was aware that to build an OR gate, to, to build an OR gate required fewer electronic diodes than to build an AND gate. And so he kind of thought, well, if only I could reverse the, or, the proportions of the gates so that OR gates predominated over AND gates, um, then there's scope for a significant saving in the number of electronic diodes used. Um, and therefore uh, a, a saving in the cost of building the machine and in the cost of running the machine as well. Um, and then he suddenly saw how to do that, how to achieve that um, uh, change of proportions. And he described his idea in the interview. Um, so this is what he said. In playing with Boolean algebra, I realized that if we just took our logical design and replaced all AND gates by OR gates and all OR gates by AND gates and let the absence of a pulse represent a one instead of the presence of a pulse representing a one, we could achieve this reduction in the num numbers of um, AND gates versus OR gates. 
Um, so that's Stutz's key idea. And he built a, a small um, demonstration prototype um, in which this idea was implemented. But he, he quickly found that people didn't understand how it was supposed to work. Um, and so he, in the end, decided to abandon um, his brilliantly novel idea and just settled for more electronic diodes in his design. It's kind of a sad story, a great <laughs> idea that never gained traction. Um, this is what he said. I remember the difficulty I had explaining to everybody that when they saw a pulse, it meant zero, and when they saw no pulse, it meant one. Um, so I, I guess Slutz's idea is like, you know, really well known to, you know, most of the people in this room now. Maybe not so much associated with Slutz's name, but kind of the, the basic principle. Um, uh, which I call slutzing, uh, you know, the, the, the slut switcheroo is slutzing. Um, uh, I want to kind of just go, go over the, the very basics of the idea in case there's anyone here, um, you know, uh, improbable though it sounds, who hasn't encountered it before. So what sluts was talking about were binary gates. And so what goes into a gate with two inputs and one output? Um, well, as he says in uh, both those quotations that I just mentioned, pulses go in and pulses come out. Um, so this is my attempt to draw some pulses. So the colored lines represent um, a varying voltage. So the, there are the peaks and the troughs. Um, and on the normal convention, the, the peaks or the pulses um, represent one and the, the troughs um, or the no pulses represent zero. And what Slut says is, um, well, let's let's abandon the normal convention and let's let the peaks, the pulses represent zero and the troughs, uh, the, the, um, the no pulses represent one. So that's the Slut switcheroo. And this is kind of the impact of that Slutz's idea has. Um, uh, these tables kind of summarize um, the impact on elementary logic. So S is a gate, um, and uh, P stands for pulse, and N stands for no pulse. And the first table um, is, is the pulse table for the gate. So that the first table just describes how the gate is hardwired to behave. Um, and then if you interpret a pulse as one or true, and a no pulse as uh, um, zero or false, then S is producing the inclusive disjunction of its inputs as shown by that truth table. So by, by interpreting pulses, we move from a pulse table to a, a truth table or a Boolean table. Um, on the other hand, interpret pulse as zero and no pulse as one, um, then uh, the gate S is producing the conjunction of its inputs. So that's the basic idea. Um, Unfortunately, Slutz never published this idea. Um, he built machines, he just wasn't into academic publishing, and um, he just kind of moved on and did other things. But it was clear from um, the way he explained the idea in the tape recorded interview, which, which dated from the 1970s, so you know, several decades after the event, but he was still full of enthusiasm for this idea. There's no doubt that he appreciated the significance of his idea. Um, but uh, Slutz rode off into the sunset and really not much happened about the indeterminacy of computation for the next 40 years. So how did Slutz's switcheroo, switcheroo idea kind of re-emerge um, and gain the prominence that it has today? Well, the the next, uh, one of the next steps on the road um, and sort of Slutz's emergence into the philosophical literature was by Roy Sorensen. This is Roy in 1996 visiting New Zealand. Um, and that's me reflected in Roy's mirror sunglasses as I put the photograph. And Roy really liked this photograph because when he was in New Zealand, he was working on his wonderful paper about mirror computation. Um, Kind of, you know, anything about mirrors would excite him in those days, reflections in sun, anything. Um, and here's the first paragraph of his mirror notation paper. 
Um, so Roy wasn't talking about the indeterminacy of computation, far from it. Um, you know, that, that wasn't his focus. His focus was what he called perspectival computation. And you can see in the, um, uh, in the, the fourth line here, the basic idea of perspectival computation, the problem solver obtains the output by, by merely, I guess that's a typo, altering um, his orientation, her, or, her orientation towards the input. So that's perspectival computation. Um, but Roy was very interested in um, uh, Boolean dual functions um, as part and parcel of this. You know, you can see how Boolean duals would excite someone who was interested in the mirroring perspectival idea. Um, and I, at this time, was, was steaming with enthusiasm for my uh, discovery of what Slas had said, which had just been the previous year. So, um, you know, I, I kind of sat in my four wheel drive as I drove Roy off to interesting New Zealand tourist destinations, um, rabbiting on about slus. Um, and in the end, I wrote a, a draft paragraph about slus and gave it to him. And with a bit of editing, he included that in his um, mirror computation paper. And there it is. So this is slus's first emergence into the philosophical literature. So, you know, he goes on, Ralph Slutz, or Gates, and Gates, SIAC, um, saving of uh, diodes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there it is. Uh, Slutz made it into uh, the beginnings of a philosophical mainstream. Um, what next? What happened after Roy? Um, another um, appearance of the same idea uh, was in a, a chapter by Ned Block in this um, wonderful 1990s collection, An Invitation to Cognitive Science. Um, there's a tantalizing sentence that Block includes in his chapter. It's not in the, the first version of his chapter, in the first edition. He slips it in in the second edition in 1995. So this is just a little bit before Roy. And here is his sentence. So he uh, he chats on a bit, four volts, seven volts, um, uh, and gate, and then he drops it in. Alternatively, if the four volt state is taken to realize zero, um, the gate is an inclusive or, either or both gate. So there's the slot switcheroo right there. Um, but Block doesn't explain this comment. He doesn't even mention it again in the chapter. Um, he just kind of sticks it in, in parentheses, and doesn't make anything of it. So I was curious, um, what was going on? So fairly recently, I wrote to Ned Block and kind of asked for the story behind this comment. And he sent me some slides, and he said, all the ideas in the slides were ones I developed in the 1980s on thinking about the intrinsic observer relative distinction. I was giving some talks on this in the late 1980s, and I used that material in my Minds and Machines courses then and for years after that. Um, and here's the key slide. And this slide is a very elegant diagrammatic um, exposition of the slut switcheroo idea. Um, Ned Block didn't know anything about sluts. I sort of quizzed him quite carefully on this point, and he'd obviously never heard of sluts and wasn't particularly interested in engineers anyway. He was reinventing the switcheroo idea. Um, I'll come back um, later on in the talk, if there's time, um, to discuss this rather interesting statement that Block makes here. Um, but it is an intrinsic fact that something is an and or or but not a ZOR, not an exclusive OR gate. But first, a bit more history. So at this point, our own Aron enters the story. Um, I don't think you knew anything about SLAS at this time, did you? So this is about 2000. Um, and you take indeterminacy to a whole new level um, with an example that we now all know so very well. Here's the paragraph that sets it out. Um, so just to... Uh, I hardly need to uh, kind of review this idea, but just to sort of take you through the guts of the idea if you haven't seen it before. Um, Slutz's gates were, were bi-stables. They had two states, high-low. Um, Oron introduced the idea of a tri-stable gate, high-low, and then the, the middle state. Um, and uh, 
it all depends on how you group the middle state. Um, if you group the middle state with the high states and label them both one, then the gate calculates one Boolean function. But if you group the middle state with the low state and call them both zero, then it calculates a different Boolean function. So that's a wrong kind of grouping trick. Um, so kind of my project, I, I was fascinated with, with Aron's example as soon as I saw it. Um, but my, my project is to, to mechanize it um, and to mechanize slutzing as well. Um, because in, in what I've presented to you so far, um, Aron's grouping trick is, and this applies to slutzing as well, it's, it's kind of, it's carried out um, in the mind of the reader or the observer. You sort of, you know, you do the grouping, well, it's gone now, but you kind of do the grouping by thinking about it. Um, so how to build a mechanism that does that? Um, how to uh, implement a ronning and slussing by means of little bits of machinery? Um, that's the question. And in a, in a nutshell, my answer is that the, the, the way to do it, or a way to do it anyway, um, is by thresholding digital pulses. You know, we're, we're talking about digital computation, that's what we all know and love, never mind the analog stuff. So let's figure out how to implement slutzing on a ronning um, in, in the arena of um, digital computation, um, where kind of pulses, pulses reign supreme in digital computation. So I want to talk um, about, about kind of in a general way about digital pulses before getting into the details. So digital pulses come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Here's just one. Um, uh, some digital pulses can be, you know, very regimented and square. And the way a wave gets to be a square wave like this is because um, somebody's built some electronic bits and pieces um, that, that function to carefully shape the wave. Um, a slightly more complicated um, uh, train of pulses, um, which have been again shaped by custom designed electronic circuits, whose, whose function um, kind of was well known to its designer, but it's a, a bit hard for us to speculate what it might have been. Um, the designer was Alan Turing, and this is a diagram from Turing's design document for his automatic computing engine, or ACE as they called it, which was another one of the, uh, the zeroth generation computers. Um, so Turing's writing about digital pulses in, uh, you know, this, this kind of holy manuscript of computation, this design document for the ACE. Um, and he's got quite a number of diagrams of pulses. Here is another one from the same design document. Um, and there he's making the point that um, pulses can get kind of beaten up as they um, move around the various parts of the machine. And so they can change their shape a bit. They can get kind of squashed and extended and more rounded and so on. And this is a beaten up pulse. But what you're looking at there is actually um, three pulses, one pulse and then a gap um, and then two pulses. And so, um, if you sketch in the actual pulses, then the pulse train that Turing is um, depicting is no pulse, pulse, no pulse, pulse, pulse. And there are kind of three levels. There's the, the waveform level, um, and then there's the pulse level on top of it. And then there's what you can call the, the, the sort of truth function level or something like that, or the bit level. Um, where you assign ones and zeros to the pulses and no pulses. Um, I think pulses are philosophically very exciting. I think, I think pulses have received insufficient attention in philosophy. Um, Turing gives a sense of the importance of pulses, um, both in his design document for the ACE and also in some um, lecture notes uh, that, about the ACE that he wrote with his um, colleague Jim Wilkinson. Um, the design document was 1945 and the lecture notes were just a little bit later. So here are some of the things that Turing says about pulses. He explained that trains of pulses circulate through the machine, the ACE. Um, the pulses are stored, transmitted, delayed, suppressed and reproduced. 
pulses are transformed into no pulses and no pulses are transformed into pulses. Trains of pulses are divided into smaller groups, which he called words, very early use of the word word. Threshold circuits carry out such jobs as to ascertain if two pulses coexist in two channels simultaneously. Pulses are counted and added, and so on. So you could put it this way, pulses are the effectors or the vehicles of digital computation. On one level, digital computation simply is the processing of pulses. There are kind of three, three levels, as I, as I mentioned a few slides back. Um, there's the pulse level, very important. There's um, kind of the ground floor level, which is where you have the actual waveforms. And then at the pulse level, certain regions of the wave are designated as pulses and other regions as no pulses. And then at the higher level, the Boolean or bit or B level, um, this level results when the pulses and no pulses are labeled with ones and zeros. So I mentioned that um, according to my model, the way to implement Moroning and also via, also slutzing um, is via, let me go back to slide, um, is, is via um, thresholding digital pulses. Um, the idea is that by means of thresholding, a single waveform can comprise a number of different pulse trains. It's like by using thresholding, and I'll, I'll explain the concept of thresholding in a minute, but by using thresholding, you get a number of different ways to zip a, a P-level pulse train onto a waveform at the W level. So I want to explain what I call pulse parsing. Um, you could call it simply thresholding, um, engineers would probably call it transition detection. Um, with pulse parsing, you start with a wave, um, uh, three peaks in this case, and you select a threshold. Um, and you know, you, if we're doing this in our mind, then you sort of, in your mind, you select a threshold. But if it's mechanized, there's a device that kind of selects the threshold or has the threshold built into it in some way. Um, and then the idea is that the pulses are the parts of the curve that are above the threshold and the no pulses are the parts of the curve that are below the threshold. Um, so let's take a slightly more complicated curve, three peaks, um, choose a threshold. Uh, so here we have uh, a pulse and a pulse, and then the, the little middle bump doesn't make it, it's a no pulse. And so then if you um, explicitly represent the, the pulse train at the P level, what you've got diagram here is the pulse train, pulse, no pulse, pulse. So we've kind of got that pulse train out of the waveform by thresholding the waveform. Um, but the thresholding can be done another way. Um, Pick a higher threshold. So um, now we've just got one pulse. Um, this middle pulse has kind of changed its allegiance. So you can see Aronin shaping up here. I mean, the, the key idea in Aron's diagram is that that middle state um, shifts its allegiance between high and low. And that's exactly what's happening here. So if you pin on pulse trade, um, then it's different from before. This time it's pulse, no pulse, no pulse. So that's thresholding. Um, same waveform, different pulse trains achieved by putting the threshold in a different place. Um, so let me talk a bit about how this impacts on the, the B level or Boolean level. So I'm, I'm going to um, introduce X, Y, and Z to make it easier to talk about voltage ranges. So X represents the, the voltage range from five volts to 10 volts, and similarly Y and Z, um, an abbreviation. So call the, the five volt threshold paths, the high paths. 
So that was the, the second of the um, examples I just took you through. Call it the high pass for the ease of talking about it. And call the 2.5 volt pass, the first one I took you through, the low pass. So consider a gate G that has got the following W level behavior. So there's its table. And this behavior is just hardwired into the gate. It's been designed to produce this behavior. So if you look at the third line, for example, um, it says that if um, input one has a voltage in the X range and input two uh, has a voltage in the Z range, then what goes out is a voltage in the Y range. And on the high pass, only X is a pulse and Y and Z are no pulses. So if we make those substitutions on the high pass, G's pulse level behavior is described by this pulse table. So that's what you get if you um, make the appropriate substitutions for X, Y, and Z for the high pass case. Um, now, some of those lines are duplicates, namely all those ones that I've highlighted. So if we chuck away the duplicates, then you get this more compact pulse table, which describes G's P level behavior in the high pass case. And then turning to the low pass case, um, in the high pass case, only X is pulsed, but in the low pass case, both X and Y are pulsed. So it's pretty obvious we're gonna get a different table. And what we get is that. And so what's the difference exactly? Um, well, the input columns are the same, of course, and the difference is in um, the output columns. So here you've got two ends. Um, and in this case, in the low pass case, you end up with two Ps. Um, so that's Oroning in action. Um, what's happening here is that the allegiance of that kind of middle-sized bump is shifting. Um, it has one allegiance in the high pass case and a different allegiance in the low pass case. And as a result, you get different pulse tables. Um, and then moving to the B level, if P signifies one and N signifies zero, then the first table becomes N and the second becomes inclusive disjunction. Um, so that's a running kind of a, a bumper sticker summary um, of what I'm trying to explain is that a running is pulse reparsing. Um, that's how you get the middle state to shift its allegiance. Threshold the pulses differently, threshold the waveforms differently. Um, moving on to slicing, um, there's, there's um, some discussion about whether a running might be completely different from slutsing. Um, Nia and I have spent you know, hours of our lives talking about this over the last few years. Years. days. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, and you know, we weren't certain for the longest time because you know, these struck us as quite difficult concepts and it was a bit hard to get in focus you know, some of the time. Um, but you know, kind of now I've come to the settled view that um, really a running and slutsing are pretty much the same thing. Um, so let me explain that. Uh, again, take a waveform, take a threshold. And um, in, in one part of the waveform, the portions of the wave that are above threshold are deemed the pulses. But in a different part of the waveform, um, the, the portions of the wave that are below the threshold can be deemed to be the pulses. So you can see slutsing shaping up here. Um, uh, I mean, this is kind of a definition, I guess, of pulse parsing and reparsing. They consist in selecting and reselecting which portions of the waveform are pulses. So if you do one parse of your waveform, the peaks are the pulses. And so um, this is the pulse train you get out, N, P, N, and so on. Um, but on another way of parsing the waveform, the troughs are the pulses. And so you get a, a completely different pulse train associated with the same waveform. Um, and th this is essentially slutsing. You know, the difference between these two cars is essentially the sluts which are out. So a running and slutsing are both examples of reparsing a waveform. So the next part of the story 
well, the next kind of next next uh, chapter in my story about how to mechanize a running and slussing um, is how to do pulse parsing in practice. How can we build um, mechanical devices that will do the thresholding for us? Um, so en engineers have various types of transition detectors. Um, which can be used to parse and reparse waveforms in the, the way that I need here. Um, to give you one example, um, by Jerry and Al, I, I grabbed this out of the um, uh, the IEEE electron device letters, not not because it has not because this particular design has any sort of intrinsic connection with the the story that I'm trying to tell, but just because it sort of it illustrates how the basic concepts can be implemented by means of physical devices. Um, so the input is going out on the left here. Um, and here's the output coming out, shown both as a, um, at the P level um, and uh, labeled up at the bit level. Um, let's take a closer look at that output. So, and there it is represented again, both in pulse form and at the B level. And uh, the, the, the pulses are, they kind of come in a random sequence. Um, and so when you label them up with zeros and ones, you get a, a random binary number coming out of the output. Um, the fact that the outputs are random is of kind of no intrinsic interest whatsoever for my story. Um, but it was the whole, it was the main biz as, as far as Jerry and um, Jerry et al were concerned, because they thought they um, could use thresholding to, um, and you know, the, the whole idea of varying the threshold and so getting different pulse trains, they thought they could use that as a way of building a, a promising new device to generate, um, kind of, you know, uh, random binary sequences, which could then be used in cryptology and machine learning and all sorts of other applications. Um, so for them, randomness was the main bids, but for us, not really. Um, it's the, the thresholding idea. Um, whoops. Uh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, it's the, the thresholding idea that I want to illustrate. And the thresholding is um, being uh, carried out in this part of the machine. Um, and so, you know, what they send in, uh, that's a nice regular um, uh, uh, waveform. And they vary the threshold at which they do the parse. And the threshold um, varies stochastically because of a property of the material that they're using, vanadium dioxide, and it's just sort of a, a nano level property of that material that it gives you a randomly varying threshold. And so each pass is carried out at a randomly different threshold. And so you get a, um, in the end, when you, uh, you know, gone through the clocks and everything, um, you get this uh, random sequence of, of um, uh, square peaks coming out. Um, so that's thresholding in action, thresholding done physically. Um, having showed you one example of how it can be done, I'm going to abstract away um, from physical implementations um, to an extent. And I want to tell you about the concept of probing. Um, so in, in my terminology, a probe is a device that does the thresholding. So it's a physical device um, but the, the actual details of how it does thresholding, we, we can kind of leave open because they can be filled in and they could be filled in in various different ways. Um, so it's a, a, it's a, a description of a pro probing as a description of a physical device as opposed to something that we just do mentally. Um, but there's a certain level of abstraction in there. Um, so start with a gate um, and add a probe kind of reads um, what's coming out of the gate, um, what's, what's coming out, pulses, uh, waveform. Um, and so it parses the output waveform one way and sends the resulting pulse train downstream to whatever consumer device there is. Um, and uh, there could be a different probe that parses the same output waveform differently and sends a different pulse train on its way. Um, elsewhere in the machine. Um, or there could be three or any number of probes acting simultaneously and generating um, different pulse trains, sending them about the machine. 
Um, this is the concept of multi-availability. These different pulse trains are all available from the same waveform. Um, as long as you have a thresholding device in place, you kind of tap the pulse trains on. Um, so a number of different probes operate concurrently, tapping off different pulse trains, which at the B level characterize distinct Boolean functions. So um, if you're thinking of, of the, this in the context of the B level, F1, F2, and F3 are distinct Boolean functions. You can write, you know, F1 is not equal to F2, it's not equal to F3. So that's probing. Um, and that's, that's really the end of my story about uh, how to uh, mechanically implement a rolling and slicing. So I want to go through a, a few sort of related issues now um, in the 10 minutes or so that remain. So let me go back to that interesting statement that Bloch made. It's an intrinsic fact that a gate is an and or or, but not a or gate. Um, and then elsewhere in the slides, I didn't show you the, the, the appropriate slide, but he says this too, a gate can be described as an OR gate and an AND gate, but not as an exclusive OR gate. Um, he's just wrong about that. Um, and you know, this, this was a claim that he was making kind of decades ago. So, you know, kind of things have moved on. It's like not Bloch's fault he got it wrong, but he did get it wrong. And I think that's, uh, it's conceptually interesting that he got it wrong. Um, I've got a sort of um, entirely trivial theorem, um, which essentially says Bloch's wrong about this. That's the import of the theorem. Um, uh, and that it's, you know, to, to, to prove the theorem, it's just like an existence proof. You prove it by actually constructing the object that's being talked about. And it's a very trivial construction. So there exists a gate, call it B for the law, such that B's P level description in the low pass case is this. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just compressing down into a single line those um, pulse tables that I was showing you earlier. I'm just using all the triples. Um, instead of you know writing the thing out more like a truth table, um, so that's B's level description. B's uh, P, sorry, B's P level description in the low pass case, um, and that suffices to establish that B sluxes between inclusive disjunction and AND, because once you've got uh, a gate with this pulse table, then you can just do the slot switcheroo. Um, you know, the way that I showed you in the slides earlier, and you do the switcheroo one way, and you get inclusive disjunction, and you do the switcheroo the other way, you get AND. Um, so we've got a gate so far um, that, uh, that does what blocks say. It can be described as an OR gate and an AND gate. I'm quite right about that. Um, it's this bit where the error creeps in. Um, so there exists gate B such that does have that P level description, but it also has this P level description if you change your parsing threshold. Um, so the difference between um, those two horizontal pulse tables is only here, the rest is identical. Um, so the, um, it, it, it's a Ronin, basically, the allegiance um, of the middle, uh, the middle bump, the middle size bump um, is changing. Um, it's uh, a pulse in this case, but in the high pass case, it's a no pulse, just like in the examples I took you before. Um, so the fact that um, B has got um, this P level description as well suffices to establish that B sluxes between exclusive disjunction and if and only if once you've got this pulse table, then you just slux away. And you get those two truth tables out, so or if and only. <clears throat> so that's to say um, that B can be described in those three ways, contrary to what Bloch said. Um, I, I guess the, the reason that Bloch made this error was because although he reinvented slicing, Aronning was just completely off his radar. So the idea of combining slicing with Aronning. Um, just you know, he never thought of it, um, and that's why he made this conceptually interesting error. <clears throat> um, so, 
So what I want to do um, in the last few minutes is to go through some um, objections to the whole idea, the very idea of the indeterminacy of computation. Um, so I've got three objections I want to take you through. And I've tried to choose them because, you know, I, I think they make kind of interesting, the objections make interesting points. So it's kind of worth um, trying to comment on the, these objections. Um, where did the objections come from? They came from the reviewers' reports of my and Mir and Marty Wolf's paper that we published, when was that, about a year ago now, 10 months, I can't remember. I don't know, decades ago. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, um, more recently, we started as a decade ago. Um, but we had wild and wonderful reviewers' reports on this paper. Um, uh, many, because we submitted it, to, you know, kind of the indeterminacy of conversation was like this, you know, kind of wild territory. No editor wanted to publish on, you know, kind of, I mean, now it's different, but um, this is going back a while. Um, and we got some, uh, they, were, they were great reading. We used to sit, you know, Zooming each other. I'd, I'd be in Zurich and um, Nia would be here and Marty Wolf, our co-author, would be somewhere in the, the wilds of Montana or somewhere. And we have these referees reports in front of us. And we kind of exchange expletives as we read through these reports. Um, but anyway, I, I collected a few of the objections. Um, objection one, um, poss possibly the least interesting of them. Um, at the P level, there is no indeterminacy. Um, and the P level is the principal computational level. I certainly agree with that. The P level is the principal computational level. Indeterminacy arises only from swapping around the labels at the B level. And that's a rather shallow effect. Slutzing is just a shallow effect. Um, there's no indeterminacy of computation at the computational level that really matters, the P level. So to that, I think the, the response is to suggest things completely wrong. Um, according to the, the picture that I presented you with, um, uh, pulse reparsing introduces indeterminacy at the P level. It's simply wrong that indeterminacy only lives at the B level. Um, indeterminacy is not just the B level phenomenon. So I think that objection can be dealt with quite rapidly. Um, this next one is perhaps more interesting. Um, in the end, a gate is just a physical mechanism, a determinate physical mechanism. At the W level, the physical level, there is no indeterminacy, um, you know, kind of abstracting away from quantum effects and so on. Um, that is an unnecessary complication. At the physical level, there's no indeterminacy. The dynamics at the W level are determinately what they are. It's only when theorists show up with their labels, P, N, 1, 0, and so forth, that there appears to be indeterminacy. But if there are gates in the reptilian brain, say, um, Nia's very keen on the idea that, uh, you know, kind of indeterminacy exists. And, you know, I, I, I agree, I think it's a great idea that indeterminacy may exist. It's, it's an empirical hypothesis. Indeterminacy may exist in the brain. Um, there may be uh, devices um, where it's indeterminate what they compute. Um, because of that, using different probes, you can tap off different functions and route them. Uh, you know, so um, other downstream units in the brain. And in this way, the brain um, kind of uh, gets more for the same amount of neural hardware. Um, it's a way of uh, spinning out scant resources. So who knows whether it's true, but it, it strikes me as an interesting idea. Um, and Nier has developed it, uh, you know, very much further than, than the sketch that I've just given might indicate. Um, but anyway, so maybe, maybe, um, uh, that there are gates in the reptilian brain. Um, but if there are, then we can safely assume um, that these will have functioned in the same way before and after human theorists arrived with their labels. Um, at the W level, the dynamics simply roll merrily on in the same determinate way, irrespective of whether anyone has labeled the waveforms or not. So indeterminacy is a pseudo problem a distracting artifact of human theorizer. So the response to that, um, and let's return to that same triple probe gate that I showed you earlier. Um, 
if a device like this does exist in the reptilian brain, then it's an intrinsic fact that pulse reparsing occurs in the reptilian brain. Um, it simply isn't, um, you know, some kind of an illusion or some kind of artifact of theorists turning up with their labels. What the illustration depicts may indeed have been occurring inside reptile skulls for millennia before human beings arrived on the scene. Labels like P and 1 and so on are very useful for describing pulse reparsing and multi availability and indeterminacy, but the labels don't create the indeterminacy. So that's my take on objection two. Objection three um, is perhaps the most interesting of them. The phenomena you speak of, so the phenomena of indeterminacy and so on, um, are observer relative. There's no intrinsic computational indeterminacy or computational multiplicity. What the computer itself does is completely determinate. But we, the observers, can take up different perspectives on what it does. And this introduces what you can call indeterminacy if you like. But this does not alter how the system works. Indeterminacy and multiplicity are in the eye of the beholder of the mechanism, not in the mechanism itself. Um, so really, I've been trying to refute that by placing indeterminacy into a mechanism rather than sort of in, in the eye of the beholder, as it may have seemed to be um, from the early presentations of the idea. We kind of have to do it all in your own mind. Um, Anyway, so that is uh, how I would answer this objection. Not so at all. Um, same uh, triple probe setup to illustrate it. It simply is not an observer relative fact that the three probes are parsing the gates output waveform differently. Um, it's a fact that they are, and that's not an observer relative fact. Um, and that could be argued using Searle's famous criterion for a, a feature f of item O being intrinsic um, as opposed to observer relative. So Searle's criterion is simply, if we all died, it, that is O, would still have property F. Simple, straightforward criterion. Um, and his favorite example is F equals nice time for a picnic. Um, by his criterion, nice time for a picnic is quite rightly an observer relative feature. I mean, if we all died, there would no longer be any nice times for picnics. Um, so if you apply this criterion to this case, um, uh, multi-availability is an intrinsic feature um, because, uh, you know, if, if you built this device um, and then we all die, um, it's still tapping off three distinct three distinct pulse tracks. Um, so multi-availability is a intrinsic feature. And moreover, until the output waveform is thresholded, there simply is no fact of the matter as to what pulse train is emitted. Um, if, you, if you just think about kind of the, the inner device, the gray blob, um, there's no fact of the matter as to which pulse train it's emitting. It's not until you do some thresholding on the waveform that it's emitting um, that you can you can uh, that it becomes dis determinate um, which pulse train it's emitting or which of several pulse trains it's emitting. So um, the indeterminacy lies kind of in the inner device. There just is no fact of the matter um, when you regard only the inner device. And it's not until the inner device is embedded in a wider context, which involves some thresholding, um, that you can talk about uh, you know, which, which pulse trains have you got here. Okay, that's it. I hope I didn't go on too long. Okay, so we have some time for questions. Holly? Oh, uh, I want to. Uh, Great idea. I love it from also, I love it from the first time that we heard something like the previous version. So thanks very much for, for this and um, um, uh, a clar clarificatory question. And if possible, um, you mentioned that there is some similarity between slutting and oroning. They're in some sense essentially 
the same, and, and I'm not quite sure I understood this point. I mean, the the oroming is is a, um, a bivalent partition of the physical states, for example, above and beyond some voltage or something like that. Whereas the slutzing is the labeling okay. of one and zero. Uh, of course, you can switch between and a gate and an OR gate in both ways, as you've shown. But but still, given a certain oroming by partition, um, you can still use the slutting of the labeling. So it's not exactly the same. I'm not sure. Maybe I missed something. Could you? Um, could not you exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and, and what you say is completely true that once you've aroned, you could then slut on top that's of the right. aroning. And that's what was going on in my anti block theorem. Right. Um, um, it's like, so um, if they're not exactly the same, what do they have in common? Um, well, they're, they're both pulse reparsing. Um, and that's kind of not obvious when you, you first see Slutz's description. Um, because, um, you know, he is all about this, where well, you kind of spot the labels. Um, but I think at a deeper level, they turn out to be the same. Um, because, um, you know, it, it, in a running, you, you reparse so that the middle state changes its allegiance. Right. In slutzing, you reparse so that what were previously pulses turn out to be no pulses. Um, because, you know, in, in reparsing, you're just, you're kind of, um, you're saying or, or mechanizing um, which parts of the curve are the pulses and which parts of the waveform are the no pulses. So kind of through my lens, slutzing um, is doing the parse one way so that the peaks are the pulses and the troughs are the no pulses, and then doing the parse another way so that the troughs are the pulses and the peaks of the no pulses. Yeah. So it's it's sort of a, a new description of slutzing, a new analysis, if you like, of slutzing. Um, but it but it is slutzing. Um, and so, once you, you look through that lens, then slutzing and aroning turn out to be quite similar. Um, there, there, there's something I still don't get. Um, so so um, the aroning parsing of the uh, of, of the signal can be done by a mechanical kind of probe, right? And the probe would either respond or not respond depending on the voltage, right? It's sensitive, for example, to a voltage above or beyond a certain level. And so it will, the, the, the world will act accordingly. We don't have to be there, right? As, as you said towards the end. Um, but um, but if we want to add, you know, we have the probe. The probe is doing whatever it's doing, and the physical output will be will be what it is, regardless of us. But if we want to add the slatting over and above this mechanism, this seems to me to come from us. Um, I mean, to we we call. Um, a certain part of the wave of the pulse, zero and the other one, or the other way around. Yes. And that changes the output for us. Yes. But it's not out there if we die, as Phil says. Yes. So in that sense, it's, it's different, isn't it? Yes, I, I see exactly what you mean. Um, but my project is to mechanize kind of both those steps. Yeah. Um, you, you were speaking as though we've mechanized the wrong um, but then we, we, and then when we slots, we kind of do it in our minds. Exactly. Um, and and my project is to mechanize both steps. So if you want to aron and then slots, you need um, some transition detectors that are doing the aroning, and then you need some more transition detectors to do the slutsing, um, which which does the switcheroo. Um, and what those that further set of of, um, of probes does um, is is um, it reads the, as I said before, it reads the, the, the uh, you know, the, the peaks in the waveform um, as, as the no pulses and the troughs in the waveform as the pulses. Um, that's what one of the, the additional layer of probes will do. Um, and the, the second probe in the additional layer 
um, we'll do the, the conventional reading of the, the peaks um, of the pulses and the troughs of the node pulses. Would, wouldn't you be able, oh, sorry, this is just because I, I don't know, don't get it. Would, wouldn't you be able, once you have this second probe that does the slotting, can't you then in your mind reverse the labeling? Yeah. Still? Yes, it, it's not that the indeterminacy kind of goes away when you probe. Oh, right. You know, if you were wrong, you can still slots. It's right. not that once you were wrong, you've got determinacy. Um, indeterminacy is a wonderful phenomenon and it never goes away. And the question is, what are we going to use it for? Um, but then I think that it does. Sorry, really are we going to go live? Everyone can like, wave his hand, but uh, Dimitri, you're now. Uh, Mary, you want to go next? Yes. Okay, so Dimitri, go ahead, and then after the votes, uh, maybe we can do. Dimitri? Hey, great. Yeah, so thanks a lot for this. Uh, very interesting. So I had a question about the uh, relationships between mostly availability and the independence of computation, right? Because I suppose one move someone might want to make is to say, yeah, you know, I agree. There is mostly availability because of the reasons that you mentioned. But when we talk about computation, part of the Individuation has to do with a specific probe. And if that is the case, then there is no indeterminacy at the P level, right? So it's just a matter of that you can use the same or, you know, depending on the probe, you're going to get different computational systems. But given a probe, then you have one computational system. So, how, so yeah, so that's what I, I'm wondering, right? So even if you show, and I think you did it. Very convincingly, that there is mostly availability. How does that, you know, translate into uh, multiplicity of computation? Um, how does it translate into multiplicity? Or in yeah, why, why does it lead to that? Right. So, um, because if we integrate computation in terms that uh, already require a probe, so we say, well, there is computation because, like, right, there, there is the, the physical goings on, and there is a probe. That is interpreting them in such a way, right? And then there is computation, right? Not before. There is nothing computation like just in the physical goes on without some probe taking some things to be signals of certain kinds rather than other kinds, right? Yes. But if that's the case, then there is no indeterminacy. No, yes. I thought that, I thought that's what you were saying. I, I think maybe you misspoke and you said, um, how do you get multiplicity out of it? Um, but the, the multiplicity is easy. You've got, you know, different different functions for different pulse trains coming out of different probes. So kind of there's multiplicity. Um, and the, then, um, and I guess this is your question. Um, so where, how does indeterminacy fit in there? Um, uh, which, is, which is a good question. Um, I, I think a, a way of, of thinking about it is in terms of an, an analogy. Um, um, if you think of a device that produces musical notes, um, and maybe the way this, this device is built um, is that it, it uses a, um, an electrical delay line, um, which can kind of sort of grab um, uh, a, 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 a waveform. And um, if you think of the, the delay line as kind of a, an oblong, um, then you've got this waveform with peaks and troughs. Uh, kind of trapped in the delay line. It's like it's sort of trapped in a bottle almost. Um, and then you recirculate it um, so that it's kind of always being refreshed and always coming back. So that waveform is kind of always, um, you know, it's like those photos where they just kind of re repeat, um, you know, after a few seconds of action, um, loop or whatever it's called. So the waveform is kind of looping through um, repeatedly. Um, and then, um, you, you get musical notes out of that by doing some, some thresholding. So you have um, the waveforms kind of coming out at this end of the, the um, delay line, say. And so you have a probe. Um, the probe consists of a thresholding device plus a loudspeaker. Um, the, the probe uh, um, produces inside itself a, a, a pulse train, and that pulse train goes to the loudspeaker. And um, the note that you get out of the loudspeaker will depend just on the frequency of the pulse train. Um, it doesn't matter how the pulse is spaced or anything else. So they may affect the kind of the timbre of the note, but the actual note that you get 
is determined just by the frequency of the pulses, nothing else. Um, so suppose you do you threshold, um, you know, your your trapped way, you threshold it in one way, um, and maybe you get sort of uh, you know peak uh, peak, and then there's a kind of a, there's a peak, there's a crest here and a crest here, but they're below the threshold, and then you get another peak. And maybe this whole thing is like one one millisecond long in time, um, and so perhaps you get doing this threshold, you get like ten peaks, um, and so there's your frequency. It's um, uh, you know ten pulses per millisecond, um, and maybe that produces. I don't know, it's probably a bit unrealistic, but maybe it produces middle C or something. That's what comes out of the loudspeaker, um, and then of course you can have another pulse sitting alongside the first one. Which uses a different threshold, maybe a lower threshold. So it catches more peaks above threshold. So you get a higher frequency. Um, and so the second pulse produces a higher frequency note. Um, so that's kind of like the multi availability case, but it's generalized from um, computation. Um, so, kind of what can you say about it? Well, you're, it's definitely a device for um, producing multiple musical notes. Um, and if you ask, well, what what note uh, does that waveform in the delay line comprise? There's no fact of the matter. It's not until you do the thresholding and so on that um, there is a fact as to what notes you've got around. Um, and so that's my model of how it is in the computational case as well. Um, once you attach the probes, um, then you've got different um, pulse functions and um, once you do the labeling you've got different boolean functions um, so you've got determinate multiplicity um, while the probes aren't attached i see no reason to say that you haven't still got um, computation you know it's a gate um, standard computational device um, but there's no fact of the matter as to what pulse train it's emitting. So that's my picture. And you, you kind of started off by saying, well, suppose we define computation in terms of having attached the probes. I just don't see any reason to do that. Um, uh, you know, just, just, just because I'm happy to say that kind of Boolean gates like do computation, even before you've added the probes, it's just they don't do any determinant computations. Well, I I just wanted to go back to the first objection that you thought was completely wrong the first one. And my point is related to the business because it seems to me that if you are just changing the labels, which is slots in the that's one way of describing slots. Yes. But I mean, in any way of describing it, you're not doing, you're not, you're just changing the labels of the, of, 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 of what, of what, what sort, you know, pulse and no pulse. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say not. Um, that's kind of, that's one way of describing slancing. It is a useful way and it gives people the idea and so on. But um, there's, there's something deeper going on. Um, on, on my analysis, anyway, on my analysis, slutzing is is pulse reparsing, um, just as much as oroing is. Um, so it, it's not just kind of mental switching of labels. Um, the slutzing actually goes on in the device. Um, so you know, slutzing at, at the P level um, is is kind of a um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a genuine mechanized effect. It's not just uh, a product of the mind, a creature of the mind. I mean, you know, kind of, you know, like it or lump it, that's the whole project, the mechanized aroning and slutzing. And so once slutzing is mechanized, um, then this objection just doesn't apply. And the, and the picture of slutzing as being something that you just do in your mind, swap the labels. I mean, that's right enough, but I've tried to move it on a stage further and mechanize that process that, uh, you know, in its original description was just something that you do in your mind. 
I mean, a Ron's description of a Ronin was some originally something that you just do in your mind. So I again I've tried to sort of move it along a stage further and show how to mechanize it. Um, so if, if you consider slicing to be now mechanized, then it's not just the, the switching of labels in your mind. Yes. Yeah, I just have a question on the on your response to objection two. Can you uh, So, um, so what, can you explain the second sentence? What, what exactly do you, do you mean with, with this? So um, I can see various versions of, of various readings of that sentence. So the green sentence spells for many years. So, uh, you mean the, well, what's the second green sentence? Or? Yes, so the second green sentence. So what's the an example exactly how this? Oh, you understand the sentence? So, you mean the, the sort of the well, that's so the reptiles observe other devices, or you mean no, it's a, it's a perfectly naive thought. It's just that something like this um, might be present in the reptilian brain, might be. So, for example, how does uh, is it? I mean, I'm trying to understand is there a concrete case when it's sort of uh, switching environment or something to switch with well near has this wonderfully complicated case about um uh, neurons in in the locusts uh whatever they have like it's, it's quite accurate to always a brain but in their nervous system um and kind of on on the story that that near tells about this is in the paper that i mentioned earlier that, uh, by uh, marty and, and near and i um so uh, there's there's sort of something like this in the locust's nervous system. Um, there's a particular neuron, um, and well, ignore one of the probes. There are there are um, systems that uh, that tap off different functions um, from uh, the same neuron. I'm I'm describing it in a, uh, with a woeful lack of um, precision. Um, but that's the basic idea. You have sort but of the, the 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 and a couple of probes. But the reparsing must be featured from, from some outside system. Uh, it's a locust. Which which outside system do you mean? Like us outside or the environment? The nerve, nerve. So what exactly is the just concretely think what, what, what I mean just must I'm trying to understand? I'm not sure why you say there must be an outside system. Unless it computes all of the functions all at the same time. Uh, oh, well, I, I had in mind that these, the, in this simple case, these are all available simultaneously. It's pumping out three pulse trains simultaneously. I'm not saying that's what happens in the locus neuron case, but well, with you, um, yeah. in this case, and let's suppose there is such a device as this um, in the reptile brain, just for the sake of philosophical argument, um, then. Uh, you know, if, if that's so, then it's been occurring for, we may suppose, millennia before humans turned up with their labels. Maybe explain the example. Because I, I don't think you wanted to say that it computes all of these functions at the same time. Uh, it seems that there's some kind of selector, some selection where we parse in more than one. Why can't I say that it computes them all? No, I thought you uh, you know that's that's multi availability. That's multiplicity. I'm I'm entirely happy with the idea that it computes at the same time. Of course, it needn't. I mean, you can have extra bits of equipment that introduce delays, so that you know maybe this one produces its function, and then that one in the next moment, and then that one in the third moment, yeah, okay. and so on. Um, all of that's possible, but I don't mind at all them acting. Mm -hmm. Um, simultaneously, you can imagine situations where that might be useful. Um, you know, if 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 this one and this one drive processes that need to be concurrent in the organism, um, then you wouldn't want them to be uh, the one to be delayed relative to the other. Okay, so we want to leave some time for coffee. Uh, let's thank our speaker. What? Does this work two ways? Can Stuart hear us? Yeah, 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 I can hear us. Stuart, tell Carl that Hi. you can hear me. Hi, Hi Carl. Hi, Carl. Right. Hello to everybody else, too.
we were all complaining that you're not here with us, Stuart. We I'm complaining too. We are very disappointed, like really. <laughs> okay, welcome sure. back, everybody. <laughs> I'm happy to present our next speaker, Professor Stuart Shapiro. He's going to be presenting work with uh, Richard Samuels and Eric Snyder. And the title of his talk is Computability, Notation, and the Real Knowledge of Numbers. Go ahead, Stuart. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to uh, share the screen. I'm seeing everyone there, uh, seeing everyone there on the screen, especially pains me that I uh, couldn't get it together to make a second uh, overseas trip in, uh, you know, within, within um, what, three <laughs> weeks or so. Um, but, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to be here, at least to be there or here, I guess, at least virtually. Let me uh, share the screen, uh, or at least try to. Um, can you, yeah, I see this? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, well, let me get your pictures out of the way. Um, I apologize for those of you who heard a version of this talk earlier, uh, a few weeks ago in Dubrovnik. Uh, I did tinker with it a little bit, and uh, but I wouldn't if if uh, those of you wish to take a nap now, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't object. Right. Mm -hmm. But the uh, this I, I did tinker with the with the with the with the talk a bit, especially in response to some uh, feedback that we that we got there. We got into Brobnik. All right. So uh, uh oh. Oh right. Well, let me put it in uh, full screen mode too. Uh oh. All right. So Kripke once noted that there's a tight connection between computation and day ray knowledge of whatever the computation acts on. Arguably, algorithms operate directly on syntactic items such as strings and on numbers and the like only via how numbers are represented. So we're going to broach here matters of notation, which of course has uh, occupied the uh, literature a little bit over the uh, past few years from time to time. The purpose of this talk is to explore the relationship between notations acceptable for computation, the usual idealizations involved in theories of computability flowing from Turing's monumental work, and de ray propositional attitudes towards numbers and other mathematical objects. So here's Kripke. Uh, this is, I um, forgot where it's from. Uh, it's, it's from his book, uh, Philosophical no Notations, I think. The notion of computability, or sorry, philosophical troubles. The notions of computability is best seen as providing a procedure for knowing which number is the value of the function, right? So the purpose of say the Euclidean algorithm is to determine the identity of the greatest common divisor of two given numbers. A use of the algorithm to determine which number is the greatest common divisor of tw uh, 12 and 64 seems to propose some sort of day ray knowledge of the in input numbers, that is 12 and 64, and it produces day ray knowledge of the result for that, or sorry, that the result for is the greatest common divisor of those two numbers. So we're broaching here uh, issues related to two of the most vexed matters in philosophy. One of them is the so-called access problem for abstract objects, such as numbers. This is often traced to Ben Asraf. If, if numbers are abstract, again, the, pro the problem goes, then how can we know anything about them? The, the issue is usually cast in terms of mathematical truths and thus knowledge, de dicto. But you know, how do we manage to know that every number has a successor, that there's no largest prime and so on? Uh, our problem here is not exactly that, but rather how we manage to have de ray knowledge of particular numbers, such as 12, 64, and 4. Right? We clearly do have such knowledge, uh, fictionalism aside. We seem to know which number is the greatest common divisor of 12 and 64, and then how do we manage this, right? The other vex, vex matter here concerns day ray propositional attitudes generally, right? So Quine and others have pointed out that in general, such matters are highly context sensitive, in particular, their interest relative, right? For example, when asking who, who someone is, we sometimes know the name and are asking for the face. Which of these people is, is Susan? Other times we know the face and want the name. Who is that person sitting over there eating an apple? Sometimes we know what a person did and want a name. Who stole, who stole all that money from the train? Right. Sometimes we know the name and the face and want to know something else. Right. See that woman over there? Her name is Sally Brown. Who is she? Right. 
possible answers in various contexts might be past partner, or professor of music, and so on. Now, Quine is famously skeptical that a fruitful account of day rate propositional attitudes is even possible for anything, let alone for numbers. Kripke suggests that Quine overstates the case. And to be sure, there are serviceable accounts of day rate, actually some very good ones, uh, of day rate propositional attitudes in linguistic semantics. These accounts all allow for context sensitivity and interest relativity in the indicated ways, right? Consider the following scenario due to, due to uh, Maria Loney, right? So someone killed Spider-Man. I love this example, right? After a careful investigation, you discover that John Smith is the culprit and now you want to arrest him. He is attending a mass ball. You go there, but you do not know what he looks like. Is the sentence, you know who killed Spider-Man, true or false in such a situation? On the one hand, the sentence is true. You know that John Smith did it. On the other hand, the sentence is false since you do not know what he looks like and cannot point him out, especially at a mass ball, right? As far as you know, this person might be the culprit or that person there. The evaluation of this sentence, this is still a loony, seems to be dependent on the way in which the relevant individuals are specified. This can be identified by a number of methods like naming or ostension. If identification by name is assumed, the sentence is true. If identification by ostension is assumed, the sentence is false. Aloni defines a conceptual cover to be a set of individual concepts such that in each world, uh, each member of the domain is denoted by exactly one member of the set. Right. Conceptual covers are sometimes called guises in the uh, semantics literature. Aloni's thesis is that certain kinds of WH questions, including many asking for day ray information, presuppose a conceptual cover. That is, they presuppose a way that um, the objects are, are going to be are to be identified. The cover can be can be made explicit, but is but typically is picked out from the context in question. This uh, sort of analysis applies pretty straightforwardly to the uh, the examples I had earlier. Right. At the beginning of the scenario. When detectives were figuring out who the murderer is, the conceptual cover would be the names of the suspects. At the end of the scenario, when the detective is trying to make an arrest, the cover would be the costumes worn by those at the ball. It is generally recognized that context sensitivity is a fact of linguistic life, and a large number of tools have been developed to accommodate this feature of natural languages. Aloni's thesis is a case in point. Case in point. That is, her, her, it was actually her dissertation. But the church, the the Turing Church notion of computability in place today is not context sensitive, let alone interest relative in these ways, or at least it's not usually taken to be. Uh, there is, for example, no context sensitivity in the notion of a Turing, Turing computable recursive function, and these notions are taken to be essentially equivalent to computability via the so-called Church Turing thesis or theses. All right, now, day ray propositional attitude reports concern ways that ordinary objects and people are represented in language or in thought. And here we encounter yet another vex matter, this time in cognitive science and philosophy of mind. What is representation and how is it accomplished? In the present case, the issues concern how natural numbers are represented. Now, putting extreme Platonism, by, by Platonism here, I mean epistemological Platonism, uh, that uh, we have, we. We have day ray knowledge or belief about particular numbers only after we manage to represent them in language or thought. <clears throat> in the case of computability over the natural numbers, <laughs> a conceptual cover in Aloni's terms would be a notation, a one-to-one -one function from a decidable set of strings onto the natural numbers. So we turn to matters of notation, something that most of you know has occupied me uh, for some time now off and on, uh, actually a long time now. Right. Back in antiquity, and of course by that I mean 1982, uh, mm -hmm. I, arg I argued that computability applies directly only to functions on syntactic, I mean that's antiquity, that was 40 years ago, right? I argued that computability applies directly only to, only to functions on syntactic entities such as strings on an alphabet. <clears throat> so here's a quote from my previous self, from my ancient self. <laughs> Mechanical devices engaged in computa computation and humans following algorithms do not encounter numbers themselves, but rather physical objects such as ink marks on paper. As strings are the relevant abstract forms of these physical objects, algorithms, algorithms should be understood as procedures for the manipulation of strings, not numbers. Furthermore, 
mathematical automata such as Turing machines, which are the abstract forms of computation devices, have only appropriately constituted strings for inputs and outputs. It follows that, strictly speaking, computability applies only to string theoretic functions and not to number theoretic functions. Right? Of course, the general notion of computability does apply to number theoretic functions. It sort of it was almost designed that way, or was was designed for that. Typical presentations of Turing machines, including Turing's own, use so-called unary notation, where number n is denoted by a sequence of n or sometimes n plus one strokes. Other common notations are binary, decimal, hexadecimal, Roman numeral, scientific notation, <clears throat> and so on and so on and so on, right? Now, my ancient time slice pointed out that not any notation, not any function from strings to the numbers will do. Again, apologies for those of you who've heard this before, or if you actually remember this from 40 years ago. Uh, for example, let X be any non-recursive set of numbers, say the set of codes of truths of first order arithmetic. Intuitively, the characteristic function of X should not be computable. It's a corollary, the usual proof of incompleteness theorem that the characteristic functions of the set of arithmetic truths is not recursive. Now, so let the members of X be A0, A1, dot, 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 in any particular order, and let the members of the complement of X be B0, B1, and so on, again, in any particular order. Now define a notation D sub X as follows. If n, is any, if n is any natural number, then let the decimal numeral for 2n denote a n, that is the nth element in the first list, and let the decimal numeral for 2n plus 1 denote b n, the nth number in the second list. Right. Now, the characteristic function for x is computable via, the no, via this notation. The usual algorithm that determines whether a given numeral denotes an even number in decimal notation also determines whether the number denoted by that numeral via this notation is a member of X, is, is the code of a truth of, uh, of arithmetic. At this point, <laughs> one option I suppose is to concede, well, I shouldn't say I suppose, is to concede that the notion of computability as applied to number theoretic functions is relative to a notation, a kind of context sensitivity. A, a former student of mine um, um, <clears throat> actually, it does come to this conclusion, right? Um, but I, but he's wrong. Um, the characteristic function for X is computable via the funny notation, but not computable via unary notation or decimal notation or whatever, right? Right. right. A better option is to follow <clears throat> standard practice and resist this context sensitivity, and that's to find some fault with the notation DX. The burden of my ancient article. <clears throat> was to articulate and defend a notion of acceptable notation, one that sanctions unary notation and decimal notation, but not this funny one. Right. Along the way, <clears throat> this is, you know, uh, I proposed an informal criteria for acceptable notation. I did not notice at the time just how this informal criterion invoked day ray knowledge of numbers, right? So I, I wasn't even thinking directly about day ray uh, propositional attitudes then, I was probably too young. Um, um, I was over 21, but all right, um, but not much. Uh, all right, so here's what I said. So if an, if a notation is acceptable, then there are two, two criteria. The agent, the agent should be able to write numbers in the notation. If he has a particular number in mind, he should in principle be able to write and identify tokens for the corresponding numeral. And two, the agent should be able to read the notation. If he if given an, a token for a numeral, the agent should in principle be able to determine what number it denotes. Notice we have these sort of WH questions or WH issues here, right? Um, he can um, write, well, sorry, in the second one, he knows which number, which number it denotes. And now again, I wasn't thinking in those terms, but this is sort of what I wrote then. Now, Rascola, Michael Rascola, once took issue with the claim that primarily computability applies to syntactic entities, but we need not engage that here, right? Uh, I guess I don't need the rest of this, right. right? So he defines a semantics to be a set, to be what I'm calling a notation, a semantics for a set of symbols to be what I'm calling a notation, right? Um, all right, so the notion of a computable semantics, now this is Rascola, uh, again, uh, not quite as, as uh, ancient as, uh, as, as me, uh, or sorry, as my previous time slice, uh, is then uh, glossed in terms of day ray knowledge and numbers, right? Uh, so a semant this, is, this is Michael. 
<clears throat> a semantics for some set of symbols is computable just in case there exists a mechanical procedure for computing what number a symbol denotes, right? Again, there's the de re um, trigger there, what number, right? <clears throat> the procedure proceeds only when the agent, <clears throat> excuse me, can understand the symbolic representation C manipulates. The agent need not know in advance which number a given system system represents. Again, there's the day rate, there's the day rate trigger, which number. But he must be capable in principle of determining which number the symbol, in principle of determining which number the symbol represents. All right. Um, now Kripke's Whitehead lectures. <clears throat> Uh, deal with uh, day rate propositional attitudes towards natural numbers. Mm -hmm. Our colleague and friend um, uh, uh, Mark Steiner um, uh, commented extensively on this as well, right? So Kripke calls the term T denoting even quantity a buck stopper for a given person at a given time. Well, he doesn't seem to recognize the context sensitivity here. Uh, so, so he calls the term T denoting given quantity a buck stopper. Uh, if the question, how much is T or how many is T, uh, makes no sense for that person at that time. Now, with buck stoppers, it's not merely a matter of not being able to give an answer that is any more informative than the buck stopper. The idea is that if the speaker asserts, asserts or hears a sentence using a buck stopper for that person, then she knows which quantity is being considered. That is why it makes no sense to ask, but how much is that in that context for that person? Now, buck stoppers appear to be instances of what David Kaplan once called vivid designators. Uh, and Quine once suggested that a vivid designator is the analog and the logic of belief of a rigid designator. It is perhaps surprising uh, that neither Kripke nor most of his commentators recognize the context sensitivity of being a buck stopper. Right? But it seems clear, at least for us ordinary human beings, that the, no, that the notion is context sensitive, if anything is. What counts as a buck stopper in a given context depends both on the quantity it denotes and the state of the person at the time. So consider uh, terms for distance, right? Suppose that someone is in Paris during the pandemic and is chatting over a phone with a friend in Kansas. Her friend asks her about the social distancing conventions in place in Paris. And she tells him that people are to stay two meters apart from each other. Now, being a kind of dumb American, she doesn't know, uh, sorry, he doesn't know uh, how, how far apart that is. So he, he then asks, how far apart is that? And she might answer a little over six and a half feet. In all likelihood, further inquiry on the part of the friend in Kansas is silly. The final statement in the dialogue contains a buck stopper for him. He knows, de re, what the relevant distance is. All right, uh, you know, you can sort of imagine similar um, buck stopping things for weight, volume, and so on, right? There are also buck stoppers and non-buck stoppers concerning ordinary numbers, independent of their use to measure anything, right? We're concerned here with buck stoppers for ordinary uses of natural numbers, independently of what is being represented. Kripke argues, well, he argues that decimaltation is a buck stopper for, for at least uh, Western educated people, right? Mm -hmm. Presumably, this applies to all such people and all numbers, but this seems incorrect. Mm -hmm. Right. For someone who has taught it, unary notation is fine as a buck stopper for sufficiently small natural numbers, say, low, say those less than five. But a given unary numeral for a larger number, say this one, it would be fair for the interlocutor to ask, what number is that? For most educated persons from Western societies, decimal notation would do as a buck stopper, buck stopping answer here, namely 24, assuming, assuming that I counted right. All right, now Tyler Burge points out that even decimal notation will not work for sufficiently large numbers, right? This is Burge. One needs to do some figuring, calculating, grouping, or simplifying of a 37 figure numerical name to grasp which number it names. Now the following is an approximation for Avogadro's number, right? It seems fair for someone to ask, well, what number is that? As Burge notes, it might helps a bit in this case to group the digits in the usual way. Right. But scientific notation is better. Right. And there it is. Right. For those familiar with this notation, the buck is perhaps stopped or if. Right. Right. We might add that some numbers don't have buck stopping notations at all. Right. Consider a product of two primes, each with 60 digits. Right. So as I mentioned in uh, Dubrovnik, a representation of such a number 
uh, uh, such a number, a number like this might be sent from one computer to another to set up a secure digital transaction. Even if one were to gaze at a page that contained a decimal number for that number, it seems sensible to ask, but what number is that, right? Is this, right? And no answer seems to be forthcoming, at least none that stops the buck, given that we need the exact number here and not an approximation. Even scientific notation wouldn't help here because you'd have to list all of the 119 or 120 digits as every one of them is relevant for the task at hand. Right. Now, what, we're, what, I'm, what I propose here, or what we propose, I keep forgetting about my co-authors, uh, we suggest that the usual idealizations involved in theorizing about computability, along with what is known about the semantics of numeral term, numerical terms, provide the key to resolving these issues. From the beginning, that is, again, this is even, this is even more ancient than, um, um, than my paper. This is all the way back to the 1930s. That would be the, 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 the prehistoric era. Uh, it, theorists, Church, Gödel, Kleene, and so on, have focused on human computation, people calculating functions by following algorithms. Only later was attention turned to machine or physical computation, and from the beginning, the focus, and, and from the beginning, the focus has always been on idealized human agents. This is made manifest by speaking of what our agents can do in principle. Now, without these idealizations, there are many recursive functions that are not computable in any halfway, even halfway realistic sense. For example, in, in a standard Ackerman function, presumably any function that's not uh, the computable function that's not primitive recursive, but this is, this is a good example. A standard Ackerman function is not computable. When one cannot compute its value at say, five, five, it's, it's a two valued function. Uh, for the simple reason that so far as can be determined, the entire physical universe does not contain enough material to express this output, let alone compute it. Right. The idealizations are familiar. We assume that the human agent will not run out of time, attention, or material, and will follow the instructions faithfully and accurately. We imagine that agents are immortal and infallible, but otherwise human. Again, as Kripke might have noted in the Kripkenstein book, whatever that might mean. Right. Similarly, we assume that each Turing machine has a potentially infinite tape and that there are no bounds in the number of states it can have. When, all right, and same thing, there were similar idealizations when machine computation was, uh, was brought into the picture. Now, idealizations like these are standard in mathematics and have been well before Turing, Church, and others started pondering the limits of computability, right? So the first postulate of Euclid's elements is a straight line segment can be drawn joining any two points, right? And then the third one is similar. No limits are specified on how far apart the endpoints might be from each other. The geometer doesn't worry about whether it's possible to draw a line between points that are so far apart that no one can, con can connect them in her lifetime, nor whether it's even physically possible to build a straight edge that's big enough to draw the line, or straight enough for that matter, right? The focus in at least all right, the focus in at least some of the previous treatments in notation is on what sort of notations are acceptable for, I for ideal agents. Those not in encumbered with limits in attention span, lifetime materials, and so on. This shows that for these purposes, determining the limits of what is computable in the relative sense, matters of feasibility and efficiency are simply not relevant. We cannot very well care at all about the demands of storage space if we're to declare the Ackerman function computable. The conclusion of my 1984 paper is that any given notation and for natural numbers is acceptable just in case the successor function given that notation is computable. That is, think about, so we, we have the given notation, think about what the successor function on numbers would be. And if that function is, is computable, or sorry, that relation is computable, then uh, then the notion notation is acceptable, right? Oh, that's sort of what the next paragraph says. Now, the usual suspects, unary, decimal, binary, hexadecimal, and Roman numerals are all acceptable in this sense. And of course, the above funny notation, dx, isn't. Now, Jack and Diane give pride of place to unary notation, propose, proposing what they call Turing's no, 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 notational thesis. Any job of work that can be done by a human computer engaged in numerical cal calculation can be carried out equivalently by a Turing computer employing unary notation. In light of the standard idealization, idealizations, Turing notational, Turing's notational thesis is equivalent to the proposition that computations use a notation that is acceptable in the sense of the ancient time slice of me. 
We noted above that in general, day rate propositional attitudes are context sensitive and interest relative, at least for ordinary humans. What about their idealized counterparts? Now, presumably, I guess I've taken taken the lesson from uh, one of the lessons from uh, you know Kripke's uh, Kripkenstein book. Uh, we do not propose a counterfactual analysis of what sort of goals and desires our ideal agents would have, given that they follow algorithms flawlessly and blah blah blah. Right? Again, whatever that might mean. Instead. Uh, one might think of idealizations such as these are not even the sorts of creatures that can have day rate propositional attitudes in anything like the ways that ordinary humans do. A referee uh, for a previous version of this uh, suggested suggested that. Right? But anyway, we don't need to, to decide it. Uh, it's not the right place to look, right? At least tentatively, I suggest, or we suggest, in the case of natural numbers, you can still make sense of a buck stopping notation for the ideal agents. This would be a notation in which for a given numeral M, the identity of the number noted by M flows directly and more or less immediately from the structure of the system of numerals and the nature of the natural numbers themselves. Again, that start, that might, that's gonna start to sound like a bit too metaphysical, but uh, you know, don't panic, it isn't, right? If that holds, then given the idealizations in place, it does not make sense to go on and ask, but which number is that, right? So now settling this, however, requires insight into what the natural numbers are, and so we encountered yet another vexed philosophical issue, right? We submit, however, that for present purposes, the idealizations make the issues tractable and do indeed privilege un unary notation as well as acceptable notations in the sense of my ancient time slice. Our modest proposal is to examine the role of number expressions in ordinary contexts and then invoke idealizations, and then invoke the idealizations, right? And that's what the rest of the paper, uh, rest of the talk is up to, right? All right, now it is generally recognized that there are three primary uses for numerals in natural language, or at least in natural languages sufficiently like English, right? There are interesting and empirical conceptual questions concerning how these uses are learned, in what order, and how the various semantics for the different uses relate to each other. These questions are the focus of much of the joint work of the three of us, but we're not going to address them here, right? The current proposal is that in the context of the standard idealizations, all three of these primary uses suggest a special or privileged role for unary notation and for the successor function on strings that denote numbers, right? One use for numerals is to express cardinalities, as in Jupiter has four moons or baseball defense consists of nine players. A cardinal number it canonically answers a how many question. An expression such as the cardinal number of can be thought of as representing a function that takes a set, a group, or whatever, a concept plurality, uh, anything with elements or members, and delivers the size of that set, group, concept, or plurality, right? property, whatever. A cardinal number is the value of this function for some set, group, concept, property, plurality, whatever. right? Now, Frege's logicistic account of arithmetic takes natural numbers to be finite cardinals, as does the abstractionist program of Bob Pale and Crispin Wright, Neil Tennant's neologicism, and many, many others. Matter of fact, a lot of philosophers just automatically assume without argument that numbers just are cardinals, right? The cardinal notion also seems to be one that children learn first by what is sometimes called counting, transitive counting. And this is to the delight of their parents and especially their grandparents, right? Uh, with unary notation, the numeral for each number n is a sequence of n or sometimes n plus one vertical strokes. So the connection between each numeral with unary notation and the corresponding cardinality is directly displayed. With the usual idealiz idealizations in place, there is no serious question about which number a given unary numeral denotes, because it actually just displays that cardinal number, which cardinal number anyway. Surely, if we're putting questions of time, space, memory, and the like aside, uh, then unary notation is a buck stopper for cardinal numbers. If one, right, right, for cardinal numbers, if you want to know what what which number of given unary numeral notes, just look at the number of strokes it contains. Uh, now, notice also that in determining the cardinality of a small but not too small collection via counting, one recites or thinks of numerals, typically decimal numerals, while pointing at each item in the collection being counted. Again, this is just what counting is, right? Counting a, a collection. This suggests a central role for the successor function on, on the numerals. To engage in counting was a way of reciting the next numeral after any given one. In other words, the agent must deploy the successor function on the numerals being used. Right. Now, Rascola points the 
uh, notes this, uh, noting that my 1984 proposal re re receives powerful support. Again, I won't finish the quote. He he can, he he notes that it receives support from the crucial role of uh, the natural numbers in counting. And again, that's because of the successor function, or the successor relation, rather. Right. In sum, given that we're invoking the idealizations and setting aside matters of lifetime, attention span, and memory, if the successor function is computable for a given notation, and the agent knows the procedure for for counting, then numerals in that notation are buck stoppers. There's no serious question concerning which number a given numeral in that notation denotes. All right, All right so that's that's one. I said there are three uses of uh, numbers in ordinary language, and and cardinals is one of them. A second use of numerals is an or is as an ordinal. In English, ordinals are denoted with expressions such as third, ninth, and sixty fourth. Sometimes ordinary numerals are used to denote such ordinals, as in Jack as contestant four and bachelor number three. For those of you who remember the uh, the dating game. One can think of the ordinal number of as a function two, albeit one a little more complex than the cardinal number function. It applies to the ordinal number of, applies to an object with respect to a finite linear ordering that includes the object. And it delivers the place of the object in that ordering. To say that my cousin Joe is his parent's sixth child is to say that Joe occupies the sixth position among the indicated children in birth order. So an ordinal number is the value of the function for some object ordering pair. All right, now to repeat, a numeral in unary notation is a sequence of strokes. As such, the strokes de display an ordering, say left to right. So each unary numeral directly re represents the corresponding ordinal, right? The last and rightmost stroke in the numeral is the requisite position in the displayed ordering for the corresponding numeral. So again, imposing the standard idealizations, unary numerals are buck stoppers for ordinal numbers as well, right? And again, going on to successor, it is often noted that the procedure of transitive counting also invokes an ordinal. When someone counts a collection, she in effect imposes an ordering on it, given by the order in which the numbers are objects are counted. The last numeral mentioned in the procedure is thus the ordinal of the last object counted with, within the opposed ordering. Wow. Okay, good. Of course, the same numeral also designates the cardinality of the collection. And for the purposes of determining cardinality, the particular ordering chosen does not matter. Every ordering will pursue the same result. So Gelman and Gallistall, two uh, developmentalists, label this the order in irrelevance principle. Here again, we see that counting presupposes the successor relation on the numerals. The agent must always know how to determine the next numeral. So here too, we have a special role for the successor function on the notation used in the procedure. All right, that's two. And so here's the third, and well, this is the last, I mean, there are actually maybe a dozen uses of numbers in ordinary language, but these are the three primary ones, I think. So the third use of numerals may be called numerical or arithmetic. It is used to talk about numbers as such. Statements such as the following illustrate this usage of numerals. Six is a number, five is prime. The first four perfect numbers are 628, 496, and 8128. Nine is Susan's favorite number. There is a lot of folklore concerning the number seven. Right. Right. The natural numbers in this sense satisfy the, the Dedekind piano axioms. They're often characterized in a formal language with a symbol for zero, symbol zero for uh, O for zero, and a one place function symbol S for the successor function. Again, this audience doesn't need the, uh, to have the um, piano postulates, the Dedekind piano postulates um, enumerated uh, in detail, right? So the first axiom, oh, is that zero is a natural number. All right, again, those, that's just a gloss on them. So taken together, the Dedekind piano axioms characterize the natural numbers as forming an omega sequence. It, arguably, these are the central features involved in the numerical uses of numerals, if not also cardinal and ordinal uses. So here too, we see a privileged role for the successor function. It is embodied in the very characterization of what the natural numbers are. From this perspective, a natural number just is either zero or the result of applying the successor function to zero a finite number of times, right? I think this is the last slide. The formal language is arithmetic contain what we take in as a canonical notation for the natural numbers. A, natural, a number n can be denoted by a string of n s's followed by a zero, right? This is clearly a variant on unary notation using this assigned for the successor function instead of a stroke. We just have that little uh, o at the end. So the canonical notation numeral for number n directly displays which number n denotes. 
the Nikonical number displays just how many times one applies the successor function to zero in order to arrive at the indicated number. And given the idealizations, this numeral is a butt stopper. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. Getting silent applause. Yeah, so we have some time for questions. Uh, Alon, yeah. you can start. Yes. Thank you, Scott. You hear me? Yeah, I can, but but uh, but but barely. You need to yeah. So if someone wanna ask a question, you need to be close to those microphones. Okay. okay. So this is now a wrong. Yes. Now it's okay. better. So you've had yeah. You've had a month to think about this question. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay. No, it gets complicated. Yeah. So. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> now it's better, so. Oh yeah, yeah. Now it's better. Okay. Uh, just uh, I wonder. Uh, first, thank you for this fascinating talk. And uh, uh, let's say that we have an oracle who you know can tell us um, um, immediately whether a Turing machine holds or not. For him, right. You asked him. It's a backstopper for. for yeah, for the oracle, but perhaps. Yeah. Right. Yes. So would you say so? So. Uh, so, so would you say that the functions that uh, are not computable for us will be computable for the Oracle because of this backstopping uh, condition? No, I don't know about computable because we're defining that specifically as you know as Turing did using using you know finite and algorithm and so on again. So I didn't want to get into the uh, you know Church Turing thesis, but somehow the. For them, uh, that funny note. Well, if if we set up a notation, you know, which involves, uh, you know, sort of like the halting problem, then that might be a box stopping notation for that for that person. Yeah, for that being. Does that help? I mean, am I addressing your question? I'm not. I'm not discussing the the the, the church drawing thesis as to what computability is. Okay. But getting it into, but you could so you could sort of connect that up with a uh, with a notation. You know, right. suppose. You know, suppose we had a notation like the one I was using, but in you know, for instead of arithmetic truths, we had you know machines that halt or self-halt, right? Then that notation would be a buck stopper for uh, that person, I would think, or sorry, that kind of being. Okay, so the distinction between let's call it deviant and non-deviant notations is something yeah. which is uh, um, backstopping relative. I mean, for the oracle uh, relative to. Yeah, relative to beings like us, but idealized in the way that you know that that they are in in computability. You know, and when it's, which is I think a sort of a standard notion of idealization throughout mathematics. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so Bucks again, I, it's sort of part of the theme that I've been pressing again. I think against Kripke, but uh, you know, I've been hearing that Kripke is rather was rather cagey about this. That the notion of a buck stopper is going to be context sensitive. Right and interest relative. It depends on who the who the agent is. So these these sort of uh, superhuman agents uh, would have a different notion of buck stopping than than ordinary human, even ordinary idealized humans would. Okay, that address your question. Yes, thank you. Right. Hello. <laughs> That's the camera that's not. Sure, am I visible here? I'm not sure. No. Visible to me? Uh, am I visible? Can you can you hear me and see me? Uh yeah, well, you're are you in the lower right? Here. Yeah, you raised your hand. Yeah, I can I can see you and okay. hear you. Right. Okay, so uh it's so here's someone else who's had, who's had, a, had three weeks to think about this, right? Okay, yeah. so it's uh, it's good to see you again. Thanks for right. the talk again. And you know, we discussed about this in Dubrovnik. I have been fascinated by your by this paper and many aspects there. So I have two more thoughts after our last discussions. Good, um, good. So one has to do with uh, this thing we discussed again about the use of uh, numbers of uh, stock the use of numbers in ordinary contexts. And I was thinking that there is uh, another use. And I don't know if uh, how can you account for this. So there is a number that um, when I was in Canada, it took me one day to obtain. And now that I'm in France, it took me one year and eight months to obtain. And this is social security number. And it is a long number. <laughs> right, yeah. it, right, yeah. it's, something that, 
I guess for some historical reasons, we use numbers for these things. We don't use sequences of letters. Yeah, we don't have social security letters, right? right. Yeah, there must be a reason why we use numbers. But on the other hand, I wouldn't want it to be given to me in a stroke notation. Like stroke notation would be, I guess- No, that'd, yeah, be, that'd be great. Yeah, right, yeah. So uh, it, it feels that this is, this is a proper uh, legit use of uh, uh, binary, not binary, sorry, decimal notation in ordinary context that stroke notation cannot account for it. I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. Or sure, no, that, 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 sound, that sounds exactly right. I mean, actually, you could probably get numbers much smaller than that. I mean, if the number was 24, right? I mean, you know, let's say, you know, you were like, you know, uh, you were one of the first person to get a social security number and your number was 24, right? Right. Stroke notation wouldn't be much good for that either. Right. So that, that, does this fit with the picture that stroke notation is privileged? Uh, yeah, only with, yeah, because the idealizations have to get fed in, right? I mean, that's the key. That's the key to the last part of the talk, right? That that they're privileged given the idealizations, and given the idealizations, uh, given given, I, given the given the uses of numbers, right? The standard uses, or at least three of them, these three standard uses of numbers, and the idealizations. Then, uh, then I claim that stroke notation and and uh, also uh, successor, you know, and also uh, anything involving successor is privileged. So the idea is that in that case, having a social security number in some, I don't know, millions of strokes would be okay, right? I mean, if I was an idealized for, for, for these, I, yeah, I mean, they might not get it very quickly, but uh, again, we're not talking about time here. Again, that's the point of the idealizations, right? Okay, and then a very a, a very short question. Another one is that uh, you say this that uh, the successor notation, success, SSSS, and then zeros, is just another way of uh, stroke notation. Yeah, is that wrong? But in some sense, it's. I think it's called, we, we do a composition of functions there. Yeah, like the success notation is not really a notation where I add zero and then S. It's just like I compose a function. Oh, that, time. yeah, that, that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of what it means somehow. It's a composed function. But if you just look at it as a notation, it's just a string of that. But you're right. It's not right. It's just I, I like, uh, yeah, just like uh, Arabic numerals aren't, aren't just sequences of, of uh, numbers. They're, you know, there's, there's some function going on there, right? But stroke English. notation is composition of uh, of is also composing functions. Well, not well, sort of. I mean, let's say it's like a, it's like three hundred and six. So that would be three times ten to the two plus uh, zero times ten to the one plus six. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. Huh? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank our speaker. Thank you, and, right. And uh, I guess we have a coffee break. Uh, there's a question from the Zoom audience, maybe? No, no. Let's go on until uh, five, or do we want to bring it forward? Because the coffee break should have been between 4.30 and five, and then we have Nahum's uh, lecture. Again, the coffee I'm putting break. the pressure back on you. So the <laughs> coffee break should have been between 4.30 and 5. Okay. We can start the coffee break at 4.15. Do we want to bring the lecture forward by 15 minutes or have 45 minute coffee break now? No, let's have 30 minutes. Yeah. So quarter to five, we'll reconvene. Yeah. Nahum, okay. you're around? I want to be around. Good. That's my favorite part of the thing. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Stuart. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Nice, nice to see you, even if it's just virtually seeing. Uh, and Stuart, I have an answer to a question from our last conversation. I'll write it to you. Oh, you don't want to? You you don't want to make it public? Well, it wasn't about this talk. <laughs> okay, I look forward to I look okay. forward to uh, to getting the email. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm happy to present uh, Nahum Joshi from Talib University, and he will talk about planet presentation. That's what I said I'm going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that was an honest representation. <laughs> so, so a few weeks ago, we were about half a dozen people on Dubrovnik, and the talk had the same title. But the content is only half the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
จาไว้นั่งอยู่เฉยไงเดียวนะจู๊ฟัดIt's not in focus. The the slide is not in focus. You have to change the window. The screen sharing. Okay, so now it's okay. Now it's okay. That's okay. Oh, good. Excellent. All right, so I can stand again. So I don't know. About twenty years ago, I was teaching a course in uh, computational models. It was called, and uh, so this was the uh, Pamela Turing machines, computability, and things like that. And one of the, this is a slide I showed them in those days when we drew slides on uh, acetate or whatever. And, and I want to show them that, you know, let's see if I can do this, that the uh, lambda calculus or scheme or list in those days, they studied scheme and Turing machines and, and uh, calculators and PCs, you know, have the same computational power. This is what I was trying to teach them. So, so the, the calculators is more like uh, I, I I think is of as a counter machine, and and what I think might have been you know like the first algorithm non-trivial algorithm ever. What was the one that that Eve used when she came back with a, a basket full of uh, apples? And this was an algorithm to share equitably her, her pickings of the day with her spouse. So. I don't have to show you the details here. One for you, one for me, one for you, one for, oh, sorry, one for me, one for you, one for you, one for you, and so on until there's nothing left. So I, I brought the counters uh, into class and advocates into class, and so I showed them pictures like this uh, and uh, algorithms like this, and uh, you can write it textually. So if you want to multiply two numbers, you now here's an algorithm to multiply two numbers given uh, uh, given in unary. Like we just heard. So uh, I'm going to uh, try to show you a movie. Four. Three in the blue ball. Four in the red ball. So multiply three now, four. First thing, check the blue ball. Is it empty? No. So remove one. Check. No. So put one in the yellow, remove one from the red, add one to the green. Is the red empty? No. no, remove one from the red while you add one to the green and yellow. Is it empty? No. Again, one yellow, one green. Is it empty? No. One yellow, one green. Is it empty? Yes. So look at the yellow. Is the yellow empty? No. Take one from the yellow, put in the red. One from the yellow, put one in the red. One from the yellow, put one in the red. One from the yellow, put one in the red. Is it empty? Yes. So back to the blue. Is the blue empty? No. Take one out. Is the red empty? No. One yellow, one green. One yellow, one green. One yellow, one green. One yellow, one green. Red is empty. Check the yellow. Yellow empty? No. Each yellow one goes in the red one. Do it all at once. Yellow is empty. Check the blue. Is it empty? No. Check it out. Is the red empty? No. So, one yellow, one green. Red empty? No. One yellow, one green. One yellow, one green. One yellow, one green. Red empty? Yes. Yellow empty? No. Take the empty the yellow ones one at a time. Yellow empty? Yes. Blue empty? Yes. Finished. How, how many are there in the green? Let's see if we got the right number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, counter machines are like the simplest model of computation one can imagine. And so, so uh, I wanted to prove this to them that the lambda calculus is at least can do everything a Turing machine can do, a Turing machine can do everything a counter machine can do, a counter machine can do everything a random access machine can do, and a random access machine can do anything the lambda calculus can do. Therefore, they're all equivalent, equal, powerful. This is what we like to teach. 
And uh, okay, this is a slide from back then. You can, uh, and I actually wrote programs, Turing machine uh, programming list, and uh, so on to, to translate from go, go around in the circle and show them all equivalent. So this is like a program to simulate a Turing machine in this. All right, but all this involves representations because, because the counter machines are working with uh, beans and uh, or apples and turning machine with tapes and lambda calculus with lambda expressions and, and uh, you know computers with I don't know what's inside them. And, <laughs> and, and uh, the, the, so we have to represent one and the other. And, and uh, Ada already realized how important representations are that even if you're working with numbers, you can arrange them and, and think of imagine your numbers as representing something else. I'm not going to quote it. And uh, okay, Stuart also already quoted himself, so I don't have to repeat it. So, so the, well, I want to talk mainly about representation and, and the perils of representations. And, and let me start with decidability and the halting problem. So, uh, the problem. So here's from a, a course now. So here, Volpe, the problem of deciding the Turing machine stops for every input word is undecidable. Okay, that depends on your representation. Just in code, you know, we saw already today, halting, even, not halting, ah, or the, or the other way around. So that's not true. So, so if you use encoding of the machines that, that uh, already give you the answer, then uh, you can solve many problems that are supposedly unsolvable. So that's what I so, so So someone might say that you want to, uh, not just have a code of the machine, but also they have to run the machine, do other things with the machine, look at the code. So it's not just enough to say count the halting ones are even and the and the not halting ones odd or something. That's not enough, but then take take some normal encoding and add one bit saying whether it halts and all inputs or not. So uh, so so here is a textbook uh, draft textbook. It also says something very that representations don't matter, just do anything you want. That's not true. So we need to be more careful. And how do we prevent uh, the encoding from giving away the answer? So, um, OK, so, so Turing sort of solved, posed the halting problem. And Christopher Strachey said that they were on, on a train once, and he explained to him how. And, the C and in, this, in the programming language uh, of this article in the computer journal, He's using a language in which you can directly refer to the program. So he's, it's hiding the representation of the program, P, just as if T of P go to L, because you can use P as its own argument and you don't have to somehow turn P into something to represent it differently. So if you have that kind of programming language, no problem. If you have though uh, arbitrary representations, we all know that that can be a problem. And so when we tell our students that halting on all inputs is undecidable, we're not telling the truth unless we talk say under which representation is Turing's representation. Now, now the, the halting problem is we usually teach it, but does this machine halt on a particular, you know, on a particular input is a version that and Martin Davis uh, may be the uh, first one to write about it. And that, that version is impervious to representation issues. And I wasn't uh, not going to give you the proof, but, but it doesn't matter how you represent the program. So and imagine a Turing machine has two inputs. One, one, is, one is the code for a machine and the other is the, in, is the input itself. Doesn't matter how you represent it, the problem is undecidable. Because uh, no encoding the Turing machine. Okay, so, so depending on, on what kind of problem it is, the representation might matter or not. So here's a text, very popular textbook, which says no encoding and Turing machines can represent a Turing machine so that you can uh, solve this question in diagonal language. Does the machine halt on the, the number or whatever, and on the string that represents itself? That's true, no encoding can. But where, where it says later on in the exercise, the same is true for the empty, whether the machine accepts nothing or accepts the empty tape, that's false. That problem does depend on how, how you represent the machine. So one needs to be careful in, in such questions. All right. So again, I said I want to do show that all these things are equivalent. So they're equivalent on the representations, but just so the representations can hide information. How do we make sure that we're not cheating here? 
and, and we are cheating, okay? And I realized after a few years that I was basically lying to my students. Let me explain why. <laughs> I taught them the finite state of Tamada here, are weaker than uh, deterministic pushdown automata, which are weaker than non-deterministic pushdown automata, which are weaker than, than uh, context sensitive and so on. We teach that. And how do we prove it? We say that one is, proper, is cont properly contained in the other. We say, hey, it's a palindrome. Pal palindrome can be represented by, by a non-deterministic automaton and not by a finite state automaton. But the same thing is true for some of these other models. So, Counter machines, a two counter machine. Uh, there's a, a technical report from MIT says no two counter machine can calculate the exponent uh, two to the n, and nor can it do n squared. And most other functions can't be computed with a two counter machine. So, when again, that same textbook uh, says that uh, the surprising result of counter machines is that no, two counters are. Suffice to simulate a Turing machine. That's correct. They can simulate a Turing machine. I'm not going to go into the details. And therefore, except every recursively in numeral language, the second part is wrong. Because normally when we compare uh, formal languages, we compare them by, by, by uh, set, set theoretic comparison. And, and we need to. So if we want to compare the, the recursive functions here with the lambda calculus, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, and, and uh, our, uh, how do we do that? So, so we normally represent, uh, we can represent a lambda term at, at, in a Gödel encoding as a number and a number as a string and, and do things like that. Okay, so, so let, me, let me also complain about some, this is some article, which is to show that, you know, fancy hyper computational Turing machines are more powerful than ordinary Turing machines. Let's just find one problem that can be solved by the first and not by the other. No, that's not enough. You have to show that everything the Turing, ordinary Turing machine does can be done by this one plus something else. All right, so we have to be more careful. So normally when, when, when I, I taught that primitive recursion is strictly weaker than general recursion, I gave Ackman's function, but it doesn't usually um, prove all these things. Prove that's not primitive recursion. It takes a few pages, but one can do it. And uh, so we do that, and, and we say that to show that, that we, we use, a, uh, but normally we use representations. So who says, sorry, we do representations and we say, here we have row, we take numbers and represent them as strings, or take strings and represent them as numbers, or we take numbers and represent them by other numbers. We do, this is how we normally show, compare, uh, or, or show, uh, that different models of computation are equivalent. However, there are examples in which it can show that a model is equivalent to a, a super model, or something that contains more functions than itself. That, that, that one can simulate the other and the, and the other can simulate the one. And therefore they're equivalent in the sense of simulation but they're not equivalent in the set, set theoretic sense because one is, is a proper uh, subset of the other. What that means is that if we really want to show equivalence of models, like I did in, 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 in uh, to show that these form these different kinds of models of computation, if you want to show that something is strictly more powerful, like primitive recursion is weaker than, than general recursion, then one needs to show the other direction also. Not only that A simulates B, but that B cannot simulate A. B cannot simulate A means that there is no representation whatsoever under which B or no acceptable representation under which B can simulate A. And we never do that, absolutely never. So, uh, okay, so here's a, a book by David Harrell and others. Uh, combining these simulations, you can see the two counter machines are as powerful as the arbitrary Turing machines. Okay. And one counter machines are strictly less powerful. Okay, so two counter machines uh, do can simulate uh, more counters and show that. But uh, who said that one counter machines can simulate? Maybe there's some brilliant representation under which one counter machines can simulate uh, three counter machines. Okay. So, uh, well, you can show it, and no one does. Uh, so, let me uh, say so, so, 
to show equivalence on uh, if we want to show equivalence that's easy one one simulates the other and the other simulates the one to show that something's strictly stronger you have to show that one simulates the other but the second doesn't simulate the first uh, now let's say you want to work with um so, so which representations are okay and which aren't so it's normal to say that we want our representations to be effective but we're trying to define effectiveness here we're talking so this is circular what about analog models came up today's discussions we want uh so we need encoding into the wheels perhaps what about hypercomputations we can't do we want to demand that the representation of some hypercomputation model is only effective in the in the, in the turing sense maybe not all right so um So I, I would say that saying that, that the representation to say that that, that require that the uh, that that the representation sorry that the representation is effective is not a good definition not in one not in one direction but on sub recursive models and not hyper recursive there's no reason to say that the representation should be effective okay so we just so we know all about this everyone has. And uh, but why successive? So we heard a little bit about why success. I wasn't convinced. Sorry, Stuart. Um, but we can prove one can prove that that the fact that that a, a model simulates successor is a necessary and a sufficient condition to say that it can't do anything hypercomputational. So so and for reasons I'm not going to prove here. So and that same is true for the domain. So the fact that that if, if under the represent you have some representation under that representation you, you're doing a simulation if that simulation includes success if you if you are simulating successor then everything you're doing can only be um computer all right so um on the other hand let's get back to formal languages i said that that, we, that I was dishonest with my students because I, on the one hand, I said, let's compare formal languages by saying, you know, context free languages are weaker than context sensitive languages. Here's an example. And, and on the other hand, I'm saying that that doesn't work when we're comparing uh, models of computation. So we have two different things going on here. So, so when we compare formal languages as, as sets of strings in, in, in a language, there, we have no choice but to use in my opinion no choice but to use uh subset strict subset as uh, the set theoretical sense in which here's uh, here's a language that you can do in one model and not in the other but when we're comparing uh models of computation and compute functions we cannot do that because we want to use representation so just here's an example i'm not going to show that that uh, re that uh, RE languages can simulate, you know, also uh, all the RE languages plus a whole bunch of uncomputable agents here, for helping, different kinds of helping functions. A and uh, so if you were you to allow representations here, then you'd be able to do more than you want to do. And it goes much worse than that. Not, not only can the RE languages simulate uncomputable things, but um, in a paper at Lix a few years ago, uh, that, that, that these authors went further and showed that a finite state automaton can can compute all you know, all the recursive languages plus countably many non-recursive languages. I mean, it can it can do anything with a, a representation, a bijective representation of strings. So the point then is that that it, you know, people encoding with strings such a finite state automaton accepts all the regular law context free and and also a bunch of uncomputable languages so the, the long and short is not, the long and short is that comparing languages use proper subset comparing uh, sets of uh, functions use representations and, mm -hmm. and you have to show the opposite direction doesn't work so i said two counter machines can't do exponentiation they can't do uh, squaring so in fact, but they can simulate any counter any counter machine no matter how many counter, which means that they can simulate more than they can compute. And that's also true about the lambda calculus. However, it's not true about Turing machines. 
a Turing machine, no matter what your representation, has nothing to do with effect. If any injective mapping will not give you more than a Turing machine. So, uh, and, and the reason, I mean, intuition for me is that Turing machines work on a very atomic level. They, they work, they look at a single letter. Lambda calculates, you know, takes a lambda term. Or, or um, so a Turing machine cannot simulate more than it computes. The same thing goes for recursive functions. They cannot simulate more than they compute, except, again, because they're working in the unit orientation. Gives them no room for doing more. All right, so I haven't proved anything, but uh, read the papers. Uh, so, so I'm saying that, that, that we want to compare, we're going to, we're going to use representations and we're going to be large, you know, generous is what a representation can be. And we can have multi-valued representations, which is like the, the, the diagram is so we call it just uh, multi-valued and nothing. Uh, so, so I would say that a representation is honest. If uh, it's injective, uh, uh, we'll also have, but I also want generators and a density. So we're, we have two domains, the abstract and C. We're going from one domain to the other, for the one on top abstract and implementation C. And we're mapping values of the domain from A to C and some multi valued uh, injective uh, function row. And then we can say that that, that it's honestly that, that a function abstract function is honestly computed at the if if it does it under some such representation. And so how do we show that something is not computable? Okay, then that the, how do we okay? I can say it's computed abstract function H is computable if we can implement implement, you know. We can implement it, and all the generators of its domains are not necessarily successive, or whatever the domain is, you have some set of generators. And if you can implement them, then, then we're fine. To show that something's not computable, I have to find a bijective function in which I can implement the generator to generate all the values of the abstract domain, but I cannot, uh, but not, but I can't do H. In other words, I don't have a recursive implementation of the, this function H, and therefore this function H is not computable. And then you can call it honestly computable. Uh, so abstract every abstract H with, of a domain that has generated G that's honestly computable. We can prove it's also recursively computable, and I can, you can find a bijective representation under which the recursive function uh, simulates. Of that domain and that and uh, the, the function H as well, that was computable. All right, so normally this is a one dimensional Turing machine from Amsterdam or something that's in the museum across the street. Of but, but, um, Turing, I, I want to sort of move in, into also issue of representation. Turing said, uh, uh, as you can see here, that, that normally we compute a two dimensional paper like this. That's how we do multiplication, two dimensions, not in one. But you can represent two dimensions uh, as a one-dimensional tape. So again, we're sort of uh, doing with with computing on the representation, or um, uh, um, these are tiling problems. Okay, so so we we normally work in well, most of our computations are done in two dimensions, and so let's talk about two-dimension Turing machines. So Turing explained that the, the most basic operations are reading and writing, and this is circle for reading and squares for writing and, and moving around. So if it's two-dimensional, you can also move up, down, right, left, not just right, left, but also up and down. So here's a program for convert, converting unary into binary. Let's go right, look and see if it's red, paint it blue, go right, look and see if it's white. Okay, any child can follow this uh, program. So this is a program, uh, writing it a little uh, less so pictorially. This is a program for square roots. The, the colored squares are uh, the color of square on, on the two-dimensional plate. The arrows tell you which way to go. The circles are asking a question. And if they, and, and sorry, the circles are, are reading the color and, and asking a question. Whether it's that color, okay, is it is it uh, black or is it? Uh, 
and, uh, and uh, the answer is yes, the right answer is number down, and the little carrot things are on the uh, arrow, you know, how to continue. Okay, another move. So if I want to do it to the sorry, uh, again. This has no sound. Okay, the program's on top. And this is a program for uh, looking for a way out of the maze. Yeah, so the maze is the blue thing. The black uh, are tells you where it's been and didn't find an exit. The, the, the Ariana's thread are those little uh, carrot marks at the path that's been taken. Rejected, rejected all those paths and eventually found the way out. Yeah, and all that little program to, to search a maze. So it's a two dimensional Turing machine. It, it works in two dimensions, as you see. And the, and the program can also be written on, you know, so on the same two dimensions. So uh, that. So if you go across the street uh, to the science museum or no, down the road there, they, they have the one-dimensional Turing machine. They also have these two-dimensional Turing machines for kids to look at that, that we designed in simple uh, problems, uh, simple two-dimensional Turing machines. So another thing I taught in this course was the church Turing thesis, claiming that anything, uh, you know, claiming, that you can't do more than an attorney machine can do. So what I wanted to do at the time, uh, you know, is find some set of axioms, some, some properties of a model computation, and to show any model M that satisfies those properties, I can show that Turing machine can simulate that model in the sense of simulation that we just been speaking about under some representation. So this is what I wanted to show them that to define the class of models M that are no more powerful than Turing machines. And fortunately, Yuri Gurevich was visiting us uh, around the year 2000, and he had this abstract state machines, and he had this axiomatic definition of algorithms, which came in very nice. So the idea is what, what something that Schoenfeld said a long time ago, perhaps we can write down some axioms about computable functions, which we all agree on, and who churches thesis thereby. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal. And that's what I said out to do. So, uh, Conveniently, I say we have an abstract state machine idea. So you have program, you have then the state transition system, you have state then transi transitions. The state will hold everything. So here the state not only has, you know, like the tape and the internal state and, and things like that, but it also has all the operations. It has the operations on the domain are, are part of the state. Now, now, something uh, Turing says about, about Turing machines is one of the things you can go out for coffee in the middle of computation, you can leave it as is, uh, and come back, everything will be the same. This is the same idea as when, when uh, they invented pastels. The painter can also go out for coffee and, and everything will dry up. So, uh, as of, uh, you often see people comparing algorithms to recipes, that's not true at all. You know, if you put a souffle and open the oven, you know, plus souffle, you can't sort of stop in the middle. So, so these analog processes like baking and cooking are not the same as digital algorithms. Okay, so, so again, the state has to have everything. So you can't have, you know, the state repeating itself and then changing to a different state because there has to be a reason why from the first state you don't change and from the third one you do change. That's so everything has to be in a state. All right. Uh, what else? If you want, we want to capture algorithm. We don't want chance. We don't want magic. We don't want insight. Okay, these are accepted uh, notions. And so we're gonna. The state is going to be some. It's a logical structure or an algebra, if you prefer, in which it has uh, interpretations of the function symbols and the constant symbols. And, and so transitions are. We're going to change the algebra, change the state, change the the, the uh, change the interpretations. In fact, so we want for an algorithm that the transitions don't change the domain, but they. Furthermore, we'd like this kind of closure on the isomorphism. 
this relates to some of the issues that arose here. You know, your, uh, whether uh, zero is change and or zero and one, this is isomorphic, this is totally isomorphic. So for me, they're the same. And you can implement it one way, you can implement your Boolean algebra one way or the other way. What's in the machine, whether it's plus five volts or minus five, I have no idea, and I don't care because I work on different level of stretch. So what you want is that regardless of how you measure temperatures, that it that that if you have a transition from two, you have transitions from two isomorphic states, you reach two isomorphic states. So close around the isomorphism is something that you want so that you can work on your level of abstraction of the algorithm. It's, it's working on a level of abstraction that's independent of how things are represented. So transition to expect isomorphism. Um, <laughs> but but the essence here, what makes a um, what makes a process algorithmic? So normally we said that we can describe it finitely. But we want something that's independent of programming languages. So Gurevich had this brilliant notion, I think, which to define algorithmic as there's a finite set of terms that determine behavior. It doesn't matter the terms over the algebra of the state, uh, uh, over the structure or whatever. <clears throat> and, and that it's a set is finite, because if you describe an algorithm, you can only talk about finite many things. So the finite many, that can't be more than finitely many things about the state that, that are discussed in the algorithm. So there should be a finite set of, uh, of terms that determine behavior. What does determine behavior mean? Not, not that you get to the same state. You don't get to the same state, but the changes that you make are the same. What you change here, you change there. All right. So, and then you prove that, that if you satisfy all these assumptions that I've been hand waving about, then there's some trivial programming language that has assignments, conditionals, and, and parallel composition. You know, here's an example of bisection search. That 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 every discrete sequential algorithm uh, can can be emulated step by step, state by state, precisely in this language. Okay, in this kind of language. So this is a representation theorem for any algorithm, uh, any discrete algorithm. So, so, but that's not just effective algorithm. So I wanted to church Turing's thesis. So I had Gurevich's ideas with uh, his postulate of what a, what a sequential algorithm is. But I want the algorithms to be effective, and he didn't care about effective at the time. So, so we just have to add one more condition that, that not only are transitions finally describable, but initial states are also finally describable. And the different ways of, of guaranteeing that, that the initial state, what you're starting out with, the information in your starting state, including the operations that you can that, that are described in the initial state, that you can all you can describe everything finally. And if the initial states are finally described and transitions are finally described, then every subsequent state is all, also finally describable. And then we can prove that any function, numeric not necessarily, uh, so in this case, any numeric function can, um, that, that satisfies the principles is partial, regardless of, of, of the. If you want to work with strings, a bunch of you wrote here that, that Turing works with, with natural numbers or strings or other sets. What, what about, uh, so what does effective mean there in the other domains is what I want to know. So the same thing. We can show the Turing machine simulate all effective models of any domain, any constructed domain. And furthermore, no representation can, can, can change it. And, can allow them to do anything beyond what Turing machines can do. Okay, so this is the kind of Turing machines uh, are the correct model of, of uh, computation. And under under any any other domain, you have an injective uh, representation allowing Turing machines to simulate them. Okay, but but there's something lacking here since, since uh, I care also about um, complexity and the like. I want some more precise way of expressing algorithms than these abstract state machines, these parallel conditional assignments that, that the Revit was working with, and take inspiration from flowcharts, the Petronet, and all of them. 
So okay, so Charles were on invented by that couple, so to speak, and, and they, they were in, um, designing uh, um, industrial processes. So I mean, Turing, you know, gives his his flow chart. So we have flow charts and we have abstract state machines that I spoke to you about already. And so now I want a model of computation that's more precise, more accurate than just that, than which I can not only simulate any algorithm, but simulate exactly the, the number of times that every operation gets performed and, and be much more precise. So, uh, so for example, so I was supposed to go to Sao Paulo or a week or two, whatever, and I, I just begged out. I was going to talk about this a little bit, so I've been talking about this for a few minutes, but what I would have said had I gone to Sao Paulo. Um, so, so Turing already told us, so we have the basic operations are read, write, and shift attention. That's all there is at the, at the atomic level. If we we saw the abstract state machines, it's a little more general, not just a tape, but you can read uh, the value of uh, you know read the value of uh, the graph uh, at one point in the graph of a function f. You know, look at f at, at the dom at the domain element one, or you can write change the value of f at domain one, change the interpretation of f. At that position, so so this is reading and writing, but on a more oh, basically hypergraph kind of uh, setup. So I want a graphical language, and which uh, that so that it's going to have both control edges, what what you do next, and data edges. If an operation needs values, where did it get its values from? And try to put this together. So so the the actions are quasi ordered. So you also have equivalent actions, those that happen at the same time. And then you have an all, and those that you don't know, which have, you know, there's no order defined between them because it's a partial ordering. And uh, then those that precede others. And, and that's what the control flow, those are the red arrows here. So first, uh, access X, then, oh, and, and uh, then you know, do the square root of Y and so on, and then uh, divide and then assign to, to, to Z. And those, if those two are simultaneous, so, so they're equivalent in the red uh, relation, you know, so the, the look in this case, look at zero and X at the same time. And so in this, um, and then the bunch of things that you wanna require, it's gonna be algorithmic process. So, for example, if you, if you, you know, read the same location, you look at the same location twice, you want to get the same answer unless something happened in, and some, someone changed in between. So, so you know, the, the, nothing changes when you're not looking and, and other such things. Uh, and also, so you want if things are not sequential, if, they, if, you, if you're not specifying the order in which they happen or you don't know the order in which they happen, they can't make a difference. So that if you have two paths in, in, the, in those diagrams and, and you have two rights to the same location, the same f of one, the only way that, that makes sense is in both places you're writing the same number. It's writing the same thing. Okay, so these, these black circles are ands, if you like. Or, uh, and then the blue, the blue arrows show you where the values are coming from. And not necessarily in the, like the red arrows, but okay, so the value of six is going to the division, and the value two is coming from the square root to the division, and those are the control flow and put them together. So we need to something like that. That uh, if a value is going from one place to another, you need there you need them to be sequential in the control order. If you compute a value and using it later, it has to be later. Okay, so so the blue arrows have to go from um, things that are ordered by the red arrows and so on. Okay, so, so that's how, I mean, I, I'm still middle writing this paper the last four years or something, <laughs> but uh, I have this view of a, a much more precise um, kind of, of generic machine. So I promise to talk about a few other things in the few minutes I still have. Okay. Five what about analog computation? So, so I want something more general, you know, not, not the sequential digital kind of properties of M to show that somehow that can be simulated the turn machine. So I haven't done that, I haven't succeeded that much yet. 
but uh, let's skip this a minute and talk about, okay, not talk about, talk about analog time. We're talking processes that involve continuous and continuous time. Uh, and so analog computation is what we're computing by analogy, you know, usually with differential equations, but maybe not necessarily. So they have this tide predictor that was an analog device. That's it's hard to predict the tides in, in bays and uh, in various places. Uh, or you have this water computer that does financial calculations. This is really cute. There's videos someplace on the internet, and I can show you uh, the famous differential engine. This is the actual analog computer. My, my father did uh, his PhD thesis uh, using analog computers. And, and this is a modern hybrid kind of computer. So that piece of foam rubber cell, a foam, whatever, solves uh, differential equations and plugged in a USB to that part. All right, and, and you write these programs. <clears throat> so, one thing that probably this is a representation of a sequence of numbers in Hava Siegelman's uh, wonderful papers. You know, who said that this representation is not hiding something, cheating somehow? Well, what, what, so this is a question I'm not necessarily going to send on the end, but if you're representing a, a, a sequence of digits by some real number, you, can, you could hide information here if you want to. And as Martin Davis complained, you know, if your inputs are not computable, then obviously your outputs are not computable. So, so. That, that's an issue. So uh, back to so uh, one thing we, we try to do is, is to formalize in the same way characterize analog computations, and we have some success maybe. So you have, here you have a, a timeline. So u and v now are a, a sort of signals, and you know first you get u, then you get v, and, and the state changes. So not only do you have the kind of changes they had before, the discrete locations in the state, but you have changes. Now, after a signal U, the new state after signal U, you know, you can look at the difference of state, see what's changed over time. And, 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 and the same kind of condition as before, that you have some finite set of terms, called critical terms, that determine behavior. So that if two states agree about those terms, then they do the same thing. They make the same changes. The delta is the changes. The ch so if X and Y agree on all the terms T, then after some signal U, the state you get to from X is, is going to be changes in the state X are going to be the same changes in the state Y. That's the condition. So in this analog world, you have not just you have these flows with some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, you have this evolution of state you know, based on setting uh, equations. What would be like? Okay. Uh, but you also have jumps with the dynamics change, and, and, and other equations change. So in, in state, okay. And okay, I think you also want the jumps. You don't want the jump. You don't want into many jumps in kind of amount of time because then you then have like a Thompson kind of problem. What you have after. But so and you can, to describe the flow, you may have an explicit uh, description or, or a uh, implicit kind of. Uh, description of uh, derivatives or something, but uh, somehow you, you describe the, the flow and we can prove that every analog algorithm that satisfies our postulates that we've only seen an inkling of here, there is a program over the same vocab vocabulary that, like we said, we have this abstract state machine program. Hey, you have a program that also has these continuous flow instructions. That, that you just that you have these equations perhaps that describe and, and with the identical behavior that the, that the change that program does the same thing as the algorithm for every state x the changes for the signal uh, for the time over time t or signal t is the same all right i don't have time to talk about universal machines so that, that came up so i'm not going to talk about them i say again that you need to be honest uh I spoke about two-dimensional Turing machines. This is a universal Turing machine, a universal two-dimensional Turing machine for four columns. And, and this gets on half a page. And uh, I'll show it to you in action. No, no sound here, so you can just uh, 
Okay, the program is on top. With, it's, it's, let's see, it is, um, I don't know how to change the speed anymore. But anyway, you can see that the, the, the box moving slowly around on top. You can't quite see it anymore. But go, there, going up on the left margin, it sees a marker at left, moves it down, and so on. So, so then it's going to see what the program says to do, go down the bottom and do it. And it, uh, that's a universal turn machine in action. All right, so, um, so again, you have to be honest, and I'm just going to show you this. You have to be honest in the sense that here's the program, here's the input. Okay, I can solve the halting problem. All I have to do is, you know, put a dot over here. If it's uh, if that program, the blue program halts on the purple input, or put the dot over there if it doesn't or something. Again, you have to be in the pairing function, and it's true for same one dimensional Turing machines too, but you don't want to hide information in the parent function. And I don't have time to talk about complexity, but it's the same thing that people that extended Turing uh, turn pieces is that Turing machines can polynomially simulate anything. Or, um, sorry, or what is it? Uh, in particular, that a RAM perhaps uh, can linear, linearly simulate anything, which we can prove. And this and using this abstract so any effective algorithm that satisfies the postulates that we had about half an hour ago can be sim simulated with minimal overhead by a uh, RAM. Okay. Uh hang up. Again, encoding is important for complexity, and uh, again, we don't we're not honest when we teach. And we have to take the cost of the representation into account if you want to be honest. It's the moral story. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, Paul. Um, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I have a stupid question. So, uh, because for me, no, it's not a stupid question, thank but you. a little bit like, you know, finding things that I should not even find out. Uh, when you were presenting uh, the, the computation models of computation at the beginning, right, and uh, the five translations yeah. that you were cheating the students, don't you think that you were cheating twice? Because you you assume that this is a standard model, right? I mean, everything. I, I I guess that from the fact that you said that successor is enough to make sure that your um, notation is the one you want, right? And successor is not computable. Uh, a non computable function if you assume that uh, there are no standard models, right? You just assume that this is a standard model. You, you don't go anywhere with it, even though. I'm, 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 in general, for the effect, I'm assuming for the effect case, I'm assuming yeah. more. I'm exactly. assuming so it's a construct, whatever the model is, it's construct. Yeah, but this is very closely. I'm asking because for me, it's very closely uh, related to representations, right? To the yes. choice of notation. Right? That's one of the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have two maybe uh, questions of clarification. One, um, I'm not sure that uh, I follow the difference between uh, uh, between representation and simulation. That the, the uh, system. Uh, can simulate another sys uh, another uh, uh, system that computes some function, but in so I'm saying simulation is under represent under a representation between uh, that maps one domain to the other. Right. The but same representation has to be used for all functions that are simulated, and both for the input and for the output. But otherwise, it can be an injection. Is what I'm trying to say. So. So, but if there is this difference, it seems that uh, uh, the simulation function, right, is somehow more permissive than the representation. I mean, if, if a system cannot compute a function f, right, but it can simulate another system that can compute this function f, so, uh, if if some some system some model cannot 
cannot you compute said for instance, the, 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 like the two counter. A two counter machine it cannot, cannot compute, compute the but, two, it can two DM, simulate. but it can simulate another system. It but can, it can simulate any. It, so it, it can simulate another out. system, yeah. right? And this system that, that is being that the system that is being simulated can compute this right. function, right. right? That's a yeah, exactly. So, so this so so this means that um, the simulation mapping, right, from the so, from the two from let's say from the two counter the representation uh, the, the system to the Turing machine, let's okay. say. Right, the simulation is somehow more permissive than the representation okay. function, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So, so my question: In what ways? I mean, I didn't. Well, so, but I'm not. Um, well, I'm trying to say that when. That we in general we use simulations. This is the standard representation. This is Minsky. Two counter machines simulate three counter machines by using an exponential representation. Okay. Okay, so every recursive function f can be computed by a two counter machine that, that maps two to the x to two to the fx for any recursive f. And you can do that. I mean, it's, you can teach it in an hour. So so the the so yes the representation is exponentiation and the two counter machine cannot compute cannot exponentiate okay and, and but that's the sense in which we normally say that a two counter machine is uh, Turing complete I mean that, that's what we say and, and even though it can't even exponentiate because we allow Exactly, like you say, we're permissive about the representation. I'm saying, from my point of view, any rep the representation can be any injection, any any okay. any injection whatsoever, because I know that no injection can will let recursive functions simulate more than recursive functions. So I'm happy, and I can prove that no under no representation can uh, the primitive recurrence. So there is no representation what, whatsoever under which the primitive recursive functions can simulate all the recursive. May Ackman, I don't know, but some variant on Ackman I can prove. You know, it grows too fast. So it doesn't matter. So uh, um, you're, you're right, but but this this is the, the, that we are being very permissive. And representation, and you may be right that that would be inappropriate in some weak models. You know, you don't want if you want to compare, you know, one counter machine with a, you know, half counter machine or something. Maybe you don't you don't want to allow exponentiation. Maybe I, I no, don't. Well, sorry, I, there is not, but I don't know of any um, principled well, argument. Here. Okay. What about computational complexity? I mean, if you use Simulation, right? So, so I, th I think the cost of the representation should be part of the complexity measure. Otherwise, you're ah, cheating. Okay. So the person who, if, so some example I didn't show, but I did in the Dubrovnik, so I skipped the end here. Yeah, uh, for me, you know, you can represent a, a graph by listing the edges in the Hamiltonian path order if there is one. It's a perfectly legitimate representation. It just allows you to solve that problem quickly. So, so if the, 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 if I want to ask a question, what's the complexity of a problem? I am the one who chooses the constructors from my domain, how you build the, the graph. I represent the graph. You want to do something fancy. So not only do you have to compute, you know, Hamilton, the Hamiltonian path, but you also have to charge yourself, you know, for changing my abstract representation into whatever one you want to use. So that's the only way to avoid. Mm. Okay, and another maybe question: When you, you use the term effectiveness, you don't use it in church Turing sense. You use it in terms of something that is constructible. But but I can prove that equivalent. I can prove that. Um, 
you know, anything that solves my effect, that my effectiveness uh, postulates are, um, give you Turing effectiveness, no more, no less. Furthermore, I mean, I, I sort of three notions of effectiveness. So one, one is that you have, that you start out only with the constructed domain. You have no, no, it's a free constructor. So you can't hide any information in, in, in the constructors either. So, so you have just a Herbrand, uh, whatever, uh, universe. And, and that, that's equivalent to doing what is common uh, which is uh, to say that for other domains to say that that, that you, you can map them into the recursive functions. You know, so you have some other domain, you know, these kind of recursive algebras that, that you can map them. Oh, and that's also equivalent to saying that the initial states have a des decidable um, <laughs> quality. Okay, you have two terms, an initial state. Oh, that, uh, uh, so, so um, I think we have a robust notion uh, of effective that is the same notion as uh, Church and Turing, so Turing in particular had in mind, okay. and which which is brutally equivalent to what Church had in mind, but not trivial. Uh, do you not agree? Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I mean, uh, I'm not going to push you against the wall, but I mean. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, um, so, yeah. Ex uh, extensionally uh, speaking, maybe at the end of yeah. the day they might be equivalent. Yeah. Right? But intentionally, um, I'm I'm not so, sure because it, okay, it's okay. something that is constructible for you is something that you know maybe yeah. can be. So intuitively, intuitively, yeah. I think we also agree that that, yeah. that the initial state or the operations and, and, and the information you're starting out with can be described finitely. That's, that's what I'm trying to capture. However, you capture, it. and I think that that when they say that the algorithm that the algorithm is finally describable, they mean two things: the algorithm and the basic operations that you're using in the algorithm. So, if you say that the algorithm is multiply, you might not tell you how to multiply, but you know that there is a finite description of multiplication as well. You know, like um, what does Menabre or whatever do, guy who, who wrote about Babbage? You know, you the basic arithmetic. Arithmetic operations. So there is a finite description of arithmetic. And if the algorithm describes how, how to do whatever square roots using the standard basic arithmetic, then you have. So, so, the, I, so everyone says that you have to have a finite description. And that's all I'm saying is that the initial state, which includes all the, all the, the operations that are given to you for free, has a finite description. And uh, different ways of saying that has a finite description, but that's, I'm just trying to formalize that notion that it has a finite description. Yeah, okay. I, I just think that doing it this intentionally is not me, uh, by effective, at least he meant something uh, more restrictive than just, uh, uh, just uh, finiteness. Uh, it might have I mean, been something this, more restrictive, the, but but, the, but the I'm, I'm telling you that for the that, physics, you could, I mean, the constraints you can put on what the human can compute. I mean, are not just finite; they are they are strict locality conditions that, for instance, are right. violated. So I'm, sa I'm saying that he is yeah. too strict. Yeah, okay. he's, he's, he doesn't have to be so strict. <laughs> you can look, you can look, you know, distant. Places too, you know. No, no, with maybe, many yeah, heads. That's right. right. Yeah, and just for him, this this is what I think he meant by effectively intentionally. I mean, intentionally, yeah, they, they turn out to be equivalent. Right. Okay. I think. Okay. Just for one last quick question. Maybe on Zoom. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay. We have to stay with the end.